a huge gamut of issues that impact the American people. And the reality is, as everybody knows, that there are going to be some issues where there are going to be very strong disagreements. Uh, and we will simply agree to disagree and hopefully do that in a respectful way. There are going to be other issues, however, that impact every state in this country, where the United States will have a 99 million primary, 70 million dental, and 156 mental health, which everybody in this committee knows is a horrendous crisis in America. So here's my hope. My hope that we can do what the pundits tell us that we can't do, and that is actually deal with the issues facing the American people in a serious, nonpartisan way. Because these issues impact every state in America. Um, I want to thank uh, our excellent panelists. I've read the testimony, and, and I thank you all for being here. And let me begin by saying that uh, it is no secret uh, to anyone that our country faces many health care crises. Despite spending almost twice as much per capita on health care as any other major country, we spend $13,000 per person, man, woman, and child, on health care. Uh, we have massive shortages in health care providers. Um, today, we're going to focus on that crisis, and that is that we simply do not have in our nation enough doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, dentists, dental hygienists, pharmacists, mental health providers, among other medical professions. And what is the impact of those health provider shortages? What does it mean to ordinary people? It means that nearly 100 million of our people live in a primary care desert where they are unable to gain timely access to a doctor when they need it. It means that nearly 70 million people live in a dental care desert, unable to get dental care while teeth in their mouths are rotting. And it means that some 158 million Americans, nearly half our population, live in a mental health care desert at a time when this country is facing an unprecedented mental health crisis. Simply put, it means that a significant percentage of our population live in places where they cannot access the health care they desperately need in a timely manner. Got to tell you, bump to some people in Vermont, and we do better than most states, I think. Guy goes in, he wants a, just a checkup. Four months later, he will get that checkup. That's in Vermont. In my view, the reality is, this reality is a contributing factor to the declining life expectancy we are seeing in many parts of our country and the fact that our overall life expectancy is lower than many, many other countries. And life expectancy, as I think we all know, is not simply a factor of access to health care, deals with economics, a lot of other things, but access to health care is an important part of why people are living shorter lives. And here is a point that you're going to hear me make over and over again, and that is that not only does the lack of medical professionals, professionals in many parts of this country lead to increased human suffering and unnecessary de death. It is incredibly wasteful from a financial perspective. If people cannot access a primary care doctor, they may end up in an emergency room, which is the most expensive form of primary health care. Somebody goes to a community health center, somebody goes to an emergency room, Going to that community health center is one-tenth the cost of Medicaid than going to uh, the emergency room. And if their illnesses continue because they don't go to a doctor when they should, they may end up in a hospital running up tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of unnecessary expenses if they got the treatment that they needed when they needed it. Study after study shows that disease prevention saves money. If people are able to access care when they need it, if there are enough medical professionals to provide that care in every part of this country, our health care costs go down. A shortage of health care personnel was a problem before the pandemic, and now it has gotten much worse. Health care jobs have gotten more challenging and, in some cases, more dangerous. Many thousands of our health care workers have died from COVID. We all know that, doctors, nurses, others, taking care of the American people. These are genuine heroes and heroines and we owe them more than we can ever pay back. 
According to the best estimates, over the next decade, our country faces a shortage of over 120,000 doctors, including a huge shortage of primary care physicians. And our goal is not only to get more doctors, is to get them to the places where they are needed, often in rural areas, in urban areas. We don't need more you know, uh, folks on Park Avenue in New York City. We need them in rural areas where people can't access a doctor in urban areas where the waiting lines are too long. Over the next two years, it is estimated we'll need up to 450,000 more nurses. Today, it is estimated we need 100,000 more dentists. And in America today, there's a massive shortage. And we will discuss this at length at another occasion in terms of mental health providers, and that is psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, addiction specialists, and many more. In addition to our overall crisis in healthcare providers, that problem is especially acute in minority communities, and we're going to be discussing that today. We desperately need more African American, Latino, and Native American healthcare personnel who are way, way underrepresented in the healthcare profession. How we address these crises is the subject of today's hearing and a, of a lot more future discussions that we will all be having. But talk and hearings, frankly, are not good enough. Our job is to get the best information we can as quickly as we can, put that information into good legislation, and to pass that legislation. Let me very briefly talk about some, some of the thoughts that I have. Others will have different thoughts. First, it is a no-brainer to understand that when over, oh, over 10,000 medical school graduates are unable to fill residency slots every year, we must significantly expand and improve the graduate medical education program. That is not within our jurisdiction, it's in the Finance Committee, but it is something that we've got to look at. Further, and in the jurisdiction of this committee, we must also greatly expand the Teaching Health Center program, a novel, really good program uh, that uh, allows uh, residents to work in community health centers and in primary care, very important. At a further, at a time when young people are graduating from medical school, dental school, and nursing school deeply in debt, everybody here has talked to graduates, doctors leaving four or $500,000 in debt. It is pretty obvious that those people graduating with huge debts are not going to go to rural America, not going to go to urban America. They're going to go to places where they can make a lot of money. And that is why we must substantially, in my view, increase student loan debt forgiveness and scholarships through the National Health Service Corp program. We have expanded that in recent years. We've got to do more. Um, further, in terms of nursing, and I've thought, well, that's an issue that I think impacts everybody. Uh, despite a major nursing shortage, and I'll tell you in my own state of Vermont, and I talked to Senator Collins about it, I think it's true all over this country. We in our hospital in Vermont are spending $125 million on traveling nurses, an insane amount of money, and yet we have young people in Vermont who want to become nurses. Our nursing schools can't accommodate them because we don't have enough teaching personnel or the kind of equipment that we need. Totally crazy, and that is an issue I look forward to us uh, uh, addressing. Uh, uh, well, that's about it for me. And you know, I want to say also a word about e emergency medical services. I know in Vermont, rural areas, you've got great people, uh, often volunteers. They have to pay for their own training. I hope that that's an issue we deal with as well. So bottom line is, look, we have an issue that the American people want us to resolve. It should be a bipartisan issue. Uh, and I intend to work with Republicans and Democrats to make sure that we get good legislation through. Uh, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The COVID-19 pandemic has strained our health care system. It's placed a huge burden on health care workers. So as we come out of the pandemic, this hearing is to address workforce issues. Why are there still shortages post-pandemic? Which are most pressing? And how do we get the understanding to address it? Uh, there's an uh, old saying in internal medicine, don't just do something, think. We must first think about what we should do. Now, physicians and hospitals in Louisiana tell me they need nurses. And speaking as a physician who had the great fortune to work with many incredibly talented nurses, uh, they are essential, goes without saying. There's different things we can do. I'm going to use an example of a woman I once worked with uh, to explain the concept of upskilling. Uh, Linda started off in the clinic as a medical assistant. She kept going to school and got her LPN, 
kept going to school and got her BS in, kept going to school and got her master's, and at the end was the nurse manager in the clinic in which she had begun as a medical assistant. That is upskilling. And along the way, she improves her family, um, helps patients, but demonstrates for her children the power of education and the power of delayed gratification. There is a lot in that story that can inform what we should be doing on national policy. And Linda, you know who you are, wherever you are, I'm talking about you. <laughs> um, now something that is, by the way, this is not all federal. We know that there is a shortage of nurse educators. But when you look at the requirements, in some states, mine included, you have to have a master's of nursing to be a nurse educator. Now I have worked with certificate nurses who have been by the bedside for 20 years who knew nursing. The idea that we cannot use someone such as she in order to educate others, I think doesn't acknowledge how much she knows. And this is a way to remove a choke point which is preventing all these applicants from having more slots in which to go to fill our nursing shortage. Now, I agree with the chair. We can and should work on a bipartisan way to address nursing shortage uh, and other shortages aside from nursing. And my hope for this hearing is to identify those other prov uh, providers and those areas, as the chair mentioned, such as rural areas that have critical workforce needs. Uh, but why don't we use the workforce we have more efficiently? I say that because there was a recent study just before the pandemic in the Annals of Internal Medicine that found that physicians spend as much as 16 minutes per patient filling out the electronic health record. Now, speaking to my colleagues, many of them retire early because they're sick of that. It is a major cause of burnout. So that which has been implemented by the urging of the federal government is creating the problem of physician workforce shortage. Um, for the patient, it is a difference between having a physician type on a screen as he tells you that you have cancer or looking into your eyes and telling you that you have hope. We need to give that physician the ability to communicate hope. Uh, this is something this committee can look into, understand, and address. On a larger scale, the federal government invests billions towards health care workforce programs. We need to continue to support what's working, understand what is not, and fix that which is broken. Uh, we have to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, not wasting money. We have to be productive. This year, the committee is tasked with extending mandatory funding for programs like the National Health Service Corps, which offers loan repayment and scholarships to health care providers in exchange for working in a health professional shortage area. And the Teaching Health Center's Graduate Medical Education Program, which supports the cost of training medical and dental residents in outpatient settings. Additionally, we are tasked with reauthorizing the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program, set to expire this year. This program, this legislation, supports training of pediatrician and pediatric subspecialists, noting that nearly half of all pediatric residents train at a children's hospital. It's important that the funding for these programs is extended on time in a bipartisan fashion and that it be paid for. Finally, I know today's witnesses have innovative ideas on how hospitals and academic institutions can support the pipeline of health professionals. One of my witnesses will speak directly to that. The federal government does not play the only role in seeking a solution to workforce shortage. We need to hear the perspective of these experts as we bolster America's healthcare workforce moving forward, and while doing so, just like Linda, create more opportunity for the individual. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, we have um, a great panel of witnesses, and I thank them all for coming. Uh, our first witness will be Dr. James Herbert. And uh, I first met Dr. Herbert when Senator Collins brought him to a hearing that we did. And, uh, I'd like uh, Senator Collins to introduce him. Senator Collins. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. James Herbert, president of the University of New England, located in Biddeford and Portland, Maine. Dr. Herbert has served as president of UNE since 2017. 
As the chairman has indicated, he offered extraordinarily insightful testimony before the primary health subcommittee in 2021. And I thank the chairman and the ranking member for inviting Dr. Herbert back to testify today. UNE is one of a handful of private universities with a comprehensive health education mission, including medicine, pharmacy, dental, nursing, and an array of allied health professions. UNE ranks in the top 20 of medical schools nationally for educating primary care physicians, particularly those trained in rural medicine. UNE is the largest provider of health professionals to the state of Maine, the only medical school in our state, and offers Northern New England's only dental college. Dr. Herbert holds a doctorate and master's in clinical psychology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a BA in psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Herbert, welcome back. I've appreciated your many insights that you've shared with me, and I'm delighted that the chairman and ranking member have invited you to return and share those insights with the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Senator Collins, and thank you very much, uh, Chairman Sanders and Ranking Member Cassidy and other members of the committee for inviting me to speak with you today. As the Senator said, I'm, my name is James Herbert. I'm from the University of New England in Maine. I won't repeat um, who we are because uh, Senator Collins just told you. Thank you very much. I would stress that we consider ourselves a private university with a public mission, and we're very proud of that public mission. As you probably all know, Maine is the oldest state in the nation. We have one of the oldest healthcare workforces, and we're tied with Vermont being the most rural state in the nation. The challenges that we face today in Maine are harbingers of what the rest of the country will increasingly confront as our nation ages and as urbanization creates pockets of underserved populations, not only in our cities, but also in our vast rural areas. So I won't detail the shortage of healthcare professionals. Senator Sanders has done that very nicely, um, and I, I know you all appreciate the scope of the problem. What I'd like to do today is to briefly outline six specific strategies that I believe can go a long way to address this crisis. At UNE, we're attempting to address each of these strategies. I don't pretend that we have all the answers, but we have found that the, what's, what's critical to moving the needle are strategic partnerships between higher education, government, business, nonprofits, and philanthropy. And it's that partnership that allows us to move forward. So first and most fundamentally, we must increase the number of doctors, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals that we educate. But educating more professionals is not as straightforward as it might seem. The biggest challenge is the limited availability of clinical training opportunities. As financial margins have tightened and clinician workloads have increased over the past three decades, practicing clinicians have less time to train students. The single most important thing we can do to increase the number of healthcare pro providers is to support partnerships between universities and community healthcare entities to develop additional clinical training opportunities. And this includes revision of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services antiquated policies around funding graduate medical education, which Senator Sanders touched on. Tuition for many healthcare professional programs is high and can be an impediment to many students. And I assure you this is not because greedy universities are trying to get rich on the backs of students. Rather, the cost of educating students has skyrocketed. Just for example, in our case, the cost of training third and fourth year medical students has increased five-fold since I assumed this position in 2017. Scholarship and loan repayment programs are critical to make healthcare education more accessible to those who would otherwise find it out of reach. As Senator Sanders mentioned, the National Health Service Corps is one example of such a program, but it's simply inadequate in many ways to meet current needs. Another barrier that's been mentioned is the difficulty in uh, hiring and retaining qualified faculty members who can typically earn more in the private sector in direct, uh, uh, or in direct clinical settings than at universities. 
So support as such as that displayed by Senator Collins and Sanders and others for strategic healthcare faculty loan repayment programs is critical to ensuring the future of the healthcare workforce. So the second thing we must do is to intentionally recruit more students who look like the communities that they serve. It's well established that individuals from underrepresented groups are more likely to seek needed healthcare services from practitioners who share their identities and backgrounds. Third, it's not enough merely to train more professionals. As Senator Sanders mentioned, we must address their maldistribution in society. That is, we must encourage them to practice in underserved areas following graduation, such as in tribal and rural and medically underserved communities. Like Maine, most states have vast rural areas of distributed population, and these communities have far less access to health care. Financial support in terms of loan repayment programs, strategic loan repayment programs, um, to practice in underserved areas is critical, and I thank congressional leadership for their ongoing support. But these programs are currently insufficient. In the case of physicians, for example, the loan repayment subsidies don't compensate for the typical salary gap between rich urban and suburban communities and on the one hand and underserved urban and, and rural communities on the other. Fourth, we must leverage the power of technology to reach underserved communities. Telehealth and digital medicine have tremendous um, potential to help in this regard. Fifth, we need changes to state level regulations to allow health professionals to practice at the top of their scope of practice. Across the U.S., many states have laws that prevent some healthcare professionals from providing services that they're perfectly trained and able to provide. Many states made temporary changes to increase the flexibility during the pandemic, and such flexibility should be continued. The focus of scope of practice regulation should be on what level of regulation results in the best outcomes and, and in terms of healthcare safety of the population and not managing guild-driven turf wars between professionals. Sixth and finally, the most fundamental change, we must fundamentally change the prevailing educational model in two ways. First, accrediting bodies need to allow training programs to be more creative and innovative and flexible without sacrificing educational quality to adopt new models. This includes so-called career laddering, opportunities that don't completely remove professionals from the workplace as they're training to upskill. Accrediting bodies should also accept more high-quality clinical simulation hours in place of hours physically spent in clinical settings, and that reduces the burden on hospitals that I touched on earlier. The second educational reform, and I'll conclude, involves breaking down the traditional silos that characterize healthcare training and practice. Anyone who's recently been in a hospital or has cared for a loved one in a hospital understands how siloed the practice of healthcare tends to be. In response, an educational model has emerged in which students are trained to work together in multidisciplinary teams, and this is known as interprofessional education. This model is shown to improve outcomes, improve patient satisfaction, decrease medical errors, and decrease provider burnout. So in conclusion, successfully addressing America's healthcare workforce crisis will require not merely acting on each of these individual initiatives in, in isolation, but in strategically combining them. And I'm grateful for your time and consideration. Thank you. Dr. Herbert, thank you very much. Uh, our next witness is Dr. James Hildreth, uh, who is president and CEO of Meharry Medical College, the largest private independent historically black academic health sciences center. Uh, Dr. Hildreth was the first African-American Rhodes Scholar from Arkansas, and he holds a PhD in immunology from Oxford University. Uh, Dr. Hildreth, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee for inviting me to give testimony today about our nation's shortage of health care providers where we need the most in the field of primary care, especially in communities without a doctor or nurse or physician to treat the sick in those communities. There are many reasons we are a country full of medical specialists, but woefully lacking in primary care professionals. But in the time allotted me today, I'd like to talk about ways to solve the problem and perhaps to solve it very quickly. I'm the proud president of Meharry Medical College, as you heard, one of the nation's four historically black academic health science centers. We were originally founded to train students that the white medical system refused to train in order that those students might treat patients that the white medical establishment refused to treat. Our purpose remains essentially the same today, 
The majority of the students that we attract come to us to learn primary care, and they intend to serve in places often ignored by mainstream medicine. And I'm proud to say that 80% of our graduates do go on to serve the underserved. In other words, we already train exactly the professionals this country so desperately needs. The majority of our students do not, have to be, do not have to be incentivized to switch from lucrative subspecialties to practice primary care. They are fully committed to working in rural communities and urban health care deserts. In many cases, their determination is born out of personal experience. They have watched a family member die of untreated diabetes or some other chronic disease. They have suffered themselves from a lack of access to wellness checks common in American communities. And I know what drives them. I'm one of them. I was born in rural Arkansas in the 1950s and watched my father die of cancer because no one would or could care for him. I have been trained at the world's most elite institutions, Harvard, Oxford, Johns Hopkins, yet I choose to lead Meharry Medical College because Meharry graduates and their counterparts at Howard, Morehouse, and Drew choose to care for people like my father, poor blacks, poor whites, poor Hispanics, poor Native American people, who deserve to be healthy just like the rest of us. I submit to you that the consortium of black medical schools already has the necessary history, structure, deep relationships with community organizations dedicated to eradicate health disparities, and we have the credibility within disenfranchised communities to help alleviate the shortage. We have been working for decades to increase the pipeline of minority healthcare workers in our country. We are already partnering with industries to support the education of minority physicians, dentists, nurses, researchers, and public health professionals. We work with neighborhood middle and high school students to introduce them to science and medicine. And at Meharry, we are grateful to Governor Bill Lee and the leadership of the state of Tennessee for supporting a program we have put in place to fast track undergraduate students into medical school who are committed to serving in rural areas in the state of Tennessee. But there's no simple solution to the healthcare shortage, and it's gonna take a variety of initiatives to solve the problem. The HBCU Medical School Consortium is well poised to lead the effort, but we need your help. We've done this work for generations, even though we've been woefully underfunded. Because of my 30 plus years at prestigious majority institutions, I am fully aware of how the federal government sometimes choose to allocate funds to institutions that are deemed uniquely qualified to solve certain problems facing the nation. Today, I submit to you that HBCU medical schools are uniquely poised to solve this problem. We ask your help in doing so. Specifically, we ask for $5 billion over the next five years to improve our infrastructure, the labs, the simulation centers, the study spaces, the classrooms at our institutions that have been egregiously underfunded for decades. This will also allow us to dramatically expand our pipeline programs that are meant to get more minorities in healthcare professions. These funds, while they are certainly significant, are mere drop in the bucket compared to other budget items and will pay media dividends to quickly expand the pipeline and close the health disparity gap. We also ask that Medicare's GME policy be amended to give expanded consideration to hospitals that train a large share of graduates from black medical schools. Finally, we ask your support to ease the debt burden of students coming from poor, working class families whose hard earned health care, especially primary care. Our students who come from lower income households often graduate with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. This debt burden can be a deterrent from entering primary care, and we need those folks in the game, and we need them right away. Our graduates are ready, they're willing, they're desperately needed, our nation's HBCU medical schools have trained them well. We know how to reach others who want, to, who want to serve just like they do. Let's do everything in our power to break down barriers standing in their way so that America can benefit from the care they'll provide and reduce the barriers to care in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hildreth. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Sarah Zanton. Uh, she is Dean of the John Hopkins School of Nursing and an advanced nurse practitioner and has published more than 200 papers. Uh, Dr. Zanton, thanks so much for being with us. 
Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to describe some of the factors contributing to our national nursing crisis and to offer some solutions for your consideration. As you mentioned, I'm a professor, a nurse, and the dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. I've spent 25 years at Johns Hopkins teaching nurses, nurse scientists, making house calls in the community, and conducting research. I state for the record the opinions expressed here today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Johns Hopkins University or the Johns Hopkins Health System. As we've discussed, our country is perilously short of nurses, and those we do have are often not working in the settings that could provide the most value. This was true before the pandemic, as you mentioned, and has become more acute. One thing that's not been mentioned is the average age of nurses today is 54 years old, and 19% of them are 65 or older. So you can imagine we're worried about the future as well. Um, and the, and the, coupled with the aging population that has more and more chronic conditions as well. There's 4.5 million nurses, and nurses are often considered the oxygen of any healthcare setting. So as a country, we need people to become new nurses, and we need to retain current nurses. And there's many steps to both. To become a nurse, one needs to first be able to imagine oneself as a nurse, to apply and be accepted to, by a nursing school, and have the resources to pay tuition, food, housing, and perhaps childcare while in the program. One needs to have dedicated time and space to learn and then pass the nursing boards. For the school to be able to admit that student, it needs enough faculty, adequate facilities, clinical settings in which to place nursing students for experience, and scholarships to offer. And then to stay in nursing, nurses need supportive, safe work environments, a career ladder, and for some, the ability to return to school to develop the science behind prevention and care. So if we take each factor separately, as a field, nursing has historically been composed of predominantly women, so men have a hard time seeing themselves in the role. Another misperception is that nursing is all hospital-based, when the reality is that only 60% is. Turning to nursing schools, 90,000 qualified applications are turned down from nursing schools each year, as you mentioned in <coughs> Vermont, due to lack of space. There's not enough scholarship and loan repayment money to support nursing students. And as was mentioned, the nursing shortage is in large part a nurse faculty shortage. The country is shy about 2,100 nurse faculty. We need to increase the number of highly educated nurses who can be faculty and retain them by paying them as much as their clinical counterparts would receive. I mentioned that schools also struggle to find nurses outside of school willing to precept nurses in training. This has been mentioned across the board. Like medical school, nursing education combines classroom learning with hands-on clinical training. And that clinical training relies on established nurses willing to precept students. And it's been mentioned about graduate medical education. There's nothing similar for graduate nursing education. There was a small pilot um, that, that has ended that was successful. So at a time when nurse shortages are glaring, nurses with a full clinical workload who are often overtaxed struggle to take on students on top of that. Finally, some schools have offices, classrooms, practice spaces, and simulation areas that are arcane. So in leaders, as leaders in nursing, we prepare for both current and future challenges. The current, we've discussed. But we also need to prepare people for the health system of the future, in which most encounters will happen at home, online, in clinics, in schools, and in businesses. So as you consider solutions to the crisis, I want to acknowledge the vital work Congress has done to strengthen and grow the Title VIII Nursing Workforce Development Programs and the CARES Act of 2020. I urge the committee to support the Future Advancement of Academic Nursing Act, or FAN Act, when it's reintroduced by Senator Merkley and Congresswoman Underwood and co-sponsors. It would address all of the areas that I've mentioned, solving barriers for students, preceptors, faculty, and enhancing infrastructure. And in closing, I'd like to highlight two additional principles to guide this body's deliberations. First, as a nation, we must strive to make nursing more disability inclusive. 27% of our country has a disability, both ethically and practically. We should tap the strengths and skills of people with disabilities. Second, robust support for preventive healthcare approaches could also save money, reduce poor health outcomes, and thus require fewer nurses. With a more deliberate emphasis on a preventive healthcare system, we might no longer have a nursing shortage. Models delivered at home, like the capable program I spearheaded, for instance, would allow older adults to age in the community. 
Today, nurse scientists are developing many models that may soon provide health care for our nation that is both better and less expensive. Thank you. I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you have. Dr. Zanton, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cassidy is going to introduce uh, our next witness. Senator Cassidy. Dr. Zanton, first let me compliment you. You finished just that your time ran out. It was just like a, it was just like a gymnast getting uh, her feet down perfectly. <laughs> uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leo Swanee. And on a note of personal pride, this is, I think, the fifth or sixth time one of my former students has testified. And I think the first time I've actually invited. So uh, you've done very well, Dr. Swanee, and I think you would say your success is despite your instructor, not because of, but anyway. Um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leo Swanee, the Executive Vice President and Chief Academic Officer of Ochsner Health System. He's a graduate of LSU Medical School, and he joined Ochsner in 2001 and has served in a variety of leadership roles overseeing both medical care and medical education. As Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Swanee leads Ochsner's partnership with Loyola regarding nursing, Loyola of New Orleans, and Xavier, New Orleans, Xavier of New Orleans, which is soon to join Meharry, becoming the sixth historically black college and university in the nation to have a medical school. He's also currently serving as interim, interim chief executive officer at Ochsner Health System North Louisiana, which has a wide rural catchment area. For decades, Dr. Swanee has worked to improve the quality of care for Louisiana families, including partnering with other academic institutions for workforce development initiatives within Ochsner so that future Louisiana health care providers have access to the <clears throat> best education possible. As a doctor and educator in Louisiana, Dr. Swanee understands the challenges that rural and underserved communities face when it comes to health care shortages. He also understands the importance of having an educated and diverse health care workforce to close the health gap and provide quality care. I look forward to Dr. Swanee's insights how to address these issues. Chairman Sanders, and uh, thank you, Senator Cassidy. I'm almost as nervous as I was on rounds with you when I was a <laughs> uh, um, And distinguished members of the committee. Um, I'm the lead of the medical education programs at OCTRA in my role as the Chief Academic Officer. And as Senator Cassidy said, I, I lead the partnerships with our universities and colleges. Headquartered in New Orleans, OSHRA is one of the nation's leading nonprofit, clinically integrated academic health centers. We deliver care to urban, suburban, and rural communities throughout the Gulf Coast. Over the last 14 years, in partnership with the University of Queensland, we've helped train 800 new physicians for the United States. We also annually train more than 330 residents and fellows through our 31 ACGME accredited residency programs. Today's hearing comes at a critical time for us. Like providers across the nation, OSHRA faces an alarming shortage of nurses, doctors, and health professionals. As Sarah Cassidy knows very well, we face a significant challenge in that OSHRA serves patients who come from low-income, rural, and historically underserved communities. OSHRA has undertaken dozens of proactive and innovative initiatives to recruit and develop a pipeline of doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals. But despite these efforts, today we have 1,200 open nursing positions throughout our system. In addition, we're also experiencing a physician shortage. Last year, the American Association of Medical Colleges projected that over the next decade, as Senator Sanders pointed out, Louisiana will be the third worst in physician shortages of all 50 states and our neighbor, Mississippi, will be the worst. During the past six months, these shortages have forced us to close more than 100 beds across the health system, resulting in the need to hold more patients in the emergency departments that are already constrained. There are two main causes for our nursing shortages in our region. First, a lack of training and educational capacity that is preventing us from developing the adequate pipelines needed to fill our current nursing positions. Second, these shortages are putting an enormous strain on our current workforce and in turn leading to loss of our bedside clinical nurses. This has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Moreover, these shortages have led to rising costs and increased competition for qualified health professionals. Since 2019, our non-agency labor costs have grown just under 60%. In comparison, over the same period, our contracted staffing costs for nurses and allied health has increased nearly 900 percent. 
OSHRA is committed to addressing the workforce shortages today and developing the next generation of health care providers. We know solutions are multifaceted and require partnerships with government and universities and colleges. We're trying to do our part. In 2022, we invested more than $5 million to operate dozens of different workforce programs, impacting more than 1,200 individuals. We're seeking to grow the pipeline of high school and college students entering healthcare careers and provide career advancement opportunities for existing employees by offering earn as you learn programs. We in the Gulf Coast regularly experience and survive hurricanes. This makes us resilient and innovative, and we've brought these traits to solving our workforce shortages. My written testimony provides greater details, but here are two examples. In 2021, Oxford invested $20 million to launch a partnership with the Delgado Community College in New Orleans to train the next generation of nurses and allied health professionals. The resources cover a new training facility and full-time tuition for Oxford employees pursuing a nursing or allied health career. We also provide tuition support for physicians that are committed to working in primary care and behavioral health, as well as tuition support for nurses that are committed to working throughout the Gulf Coast at the Ochsner system post-graduation. We, uh, we understand and take real responsibility that we need to train a more diverse workforce that represent the diverse communities that Louisiana and Mississippi to that end, in January, Oxford partnered with the Xavier University, one of our premier HBCUs, to announce plans to create the Xavier Oxford College of Medicine with the explicit mission to increase the number of underrepresented physicians in the U.S. We appreciate that Congress has taken several steps to address healthcare workforce gaps. However, additional efforts are needed to bolster local efforts like the ones we have undertaken. My written testimony provides a range of ideas, including investments to help scale our proven local solutions, increasing the number of GME slots, and providing more stable Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement climate for our physicians. In conclusion, on behalf of Oxford and all the communities we have the privilege of serving, thank you again for this opportunity. We stand ready to work with you and your colleagues through public-private partnerships to ensure access to quality care for the patients across the Gulf Coast and our nation. Dr. Smoney, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, our final witness will be Dr. Douglas Steger, professor at Dartmouth College. Uh, Dr. Steger received his PhD in economics from MIT and has served as faculty at Stanford and Harvard before joining Dartmouth in 1998. Uh, Dr. Steger, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Chairman Sanders. Ranking Member Cassidy, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here this morning. Uh, no group of workers has been touched more directly and deeply by the COVID-19 pandemic than frontline healthcare providers, particularly nurses. I'm gonna focus my comments on nurses this morning, and I'm an economist, so I'm gonna focus on data about uh, employment and earnings in nurses. Uh, the US has enjoyed steady growth in the registered nurse workforce, doubling the number of RNs per capita over the last four decades. However, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the RN workforce has been in flux. So developing effective policies to strengthen the current and future RN workforce requires timely data. Over the last 20 years, I've worked with the research team to identify emerging trends in the healthcare workforce and forecast the future supply of RNs. And based on our recent and ongoing research, we can see three key issues going forward. First, after a sharp decline in 2021, our unemployment recovered in 2022, and now is nearly 5% above where it was in 2019 before the pandemic. So there's been strong growth. Our earnings have grown slightly faster than inflation during the pandemic, whereas earnings in other occupations have grown more slowly than inflation. So encouragingly, as of 2022, both our unemployment and earnings are at or above their pre-pandemic trends. Uh, but the big change that we've seen during the pandemic has been a shift of our employment away from hospitals and into other settings, such as outpatient clinics, physician offices, schools, et cetera. All of the growth in our unemployment since 2019 occurred outside of hospitals. And that's very unusual. We haven't seen that in years before. 
This helps to explain why hospitals are reporting shortages of RNs, right? If this trend continues, actions will be needed to improve the work environment and attract RNs back to working, to working in hospitals. Otherwise, hospitals will need to develop strategies and be supported to better utilize a smaller RN workforce. Second key issue for the future supply of RNs is the educational pipeline. Application to nursing schools dipped in 2020, but rebounded strongly in 2021, and have continued their upward trend. Today are as high as they've ever been. However, the pandemic decreased academic preparedness of high school students entering nursing programs, which threatens to slow their educational progression and entry into the workforce. Similar patterns are seen in nurses taking the licensure exam, continued steady growth in numbers taking the exam, but a notable decline in pass rates from 88% pre-pandemic to about 81, 82% in the last couple of years. These trends parallel the decline in academic achievement during the pandemic for students in K-12 education, uh, particularly those attending high poverty schools who lag roughly half a grade level behind pre-pandemic achievement levels. Nursing schools and employers realize they have to provide their nursing students and new nurse employees with additional training, and this may need federal support. Third key issue, key issue is the adequacy of the rural RN workforce, which I know is a concern of members of the committee. The number of RNs per capita in rural areas is actually comparable to urban areas and projected to steadily grow amidst declining rural physicians and limited rural nurse practitioners. So it's actually quite different from physicians where physicians in rural areas are definitely underrepresented. Um, however, rural RNs are markedly less diverse than the population they serve, and only half of rural RNs have a bachelor's degree or higher, compared to over 70% for urban RNs in a recommendation 10 years ago from the National Academy of Medicine that 80% uh, that that of RNs be, have bachelor's degrees by 2020. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has recently announced large investments in the rural health workforce, which could be used for programs such as the scholarship and, and loan forgiveness that increase bachelor's degrees among rural RNs and help achieve greater diversity among RNs in rural communities. Putting all this evidence together, uh, we've updated our forecasts and actually continue to forecast strong growth in the RN workforce forecast that there will be an additional million RNs over the next decade in the workforce, on top of the current workforce, employed workforce of about three and a half million. Uh, the main concerns that need to be addressed in the near term are the shift of RN workforce away from the hospital, uh, decreased preparedness of students entering and exit nursing schools, and the need to diversify the rural workforce and increase bachelor's degrees among rural RNs. Finally, as I stated at the beginning, effective workforce planning and policy making requires timely data and analysis. It would be valuable if there was a federal effort to coordinate collection of better data on healthcare workforce that could be used to monitor the lingering effects of COVID-19 pandemic. This was something also that was recommended in an earlier National Academy of Medicine report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin the questioning and uh, give the mic over to Senator Cassidy, and we'll go around the table. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in my state, in our largest hospital, uh, we have seen a huge expenditure of $125 million for traveling nurses at a time when we have more young people who want to become nurses but can't accommodate them uh, in our nursing schools. Uh, Dr. Herbert, is that, in fact, just the Vermont problem, or is that a main problem? Is that a national problem? Um, Senator Sanders, it's very much a national problem. The traveling nurse uh, situation that you described, I mean, you're exactly right. We're, we're seeing the exact same thing in Maine. Um, it, there's a, a number of reasons for it, but I think what you're hearing from the panel today, there's consistency in terms of the nurse educator problem. Um, but there's also, you know, hospitals are really strapped uh, with the workload issues that I that I described earlier in terms of reimbursements. And so it's it's complicated, but the clinical training sites like hospitals need support to be able to accommodate more trainees, um, which will help with the problem. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Zanton, um, how are we going to, give me some specific ideas 
as to how we get more nurse educators out there so we can accommodate the number of young people who want to become nurses? If we could um, increase the, all the programs through HRSA, like the Nurse Corps, <coughs> that would be a really concrete suggestion. Um, currently, almost none of our students are able to get the Nurse Corps because we were a master's program. So I think, um, you know, solving all the problems that we talked about um, and having more simulation, you know, passing the FAN Act would be ways of quickly trying to increase the nurse faculty um, abilities of this country. Okay. Um, Dr. Hildreth, uh, it is widely recognized, not debated, that African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans are underrepresented in the healthcare profession. No one debates that. What is the impact of that? You know, people say, so what's the difference? You know, so you have a white doctor, a black doctor, who cares? Is there a difference? What is the difference? Thank you, Senator Sanders. Um, the data are very clear, as my colleague referenced earlier, that when the healthcare workforce reflects the population they care for, outcomes are better. That's not to say that a white doctor can't provide great care to a black patient. That happens every single day in our country and vice versa. But when the provider team looks like the population they're caring for, the outcomes are better. That's been demonstrated over and over again. That's what we lose by not having a diverse workforce, the best outcomes for communities. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Swanee, uh, you talked about large areas of Louisiana, in fact, all over this country, uh, not having enough uh, physicians, uh, nurses, etc. It's a little bit outside of the scope of this hearing, although I'm going to get back to it because we have jurisdiction over the community health center program. Do you think that expanding community health centers to rural areas in America would make a lot of sense? Thank you for that question, Senator Sanders. I do. Uh, I think they're important. Oshner is starting 13 community health centers throughout Louisiana. They, they serve an important need. Are these federally qualified community health centers? These are our own. We're going outside the federally health qualified centers. So we partner with federally health qualified centers, and we're starting our own community health centers, too. Uh, we're meeting all the federally health qualified center uh, uh, guidelines, uh, but it was quicker to get there into our communities to serve. Would it be advantageous if, the, if they were FQHCs? Would it work well for you or not? Uh, it would be advantageous if we could work with the government to make health centers like Osher be able to start these federally health qualified centers and spread them more quickly. Good. Um, let me ask, um, go back to Dr. Herbert. Uh, one of the areas that we do have jurisdiction over, and I'm, I'm very strongly in, in support of the teaching health centers, GME. And that is an opportunity to get residents out of teaching hospitals and into primary health care facilities. Perhaps you and Dr. Hildreth can say a word about that. Is that a good idea to expand those programs? That's a very good idea. And because of the, um, the, the, the caps on GME funding from the federal government, states have actually stepped in and done some creative things. I mean, for example, the state of Georgia has done that. We're now working with colleagues in Maine to establish, um, tr trying to get some legislation through the state of Maine to actually directly fund GME through partnerships um, based in community health uh, hospitals, community hospitals, but in partnerships with the teaching hospitals. So there's some creative things that can be done. It can be done much more fast, much more quickly if the, the um, CMS rules were changed in the way they fund GME, but there's innovative, other innovative ways of, of doing it, but we absolutely need more GME. This is critical not only for primary care, but for some specialty care as well. Uh, Senator Sanders and I were, uh, Senator Collins and I, I apologize, were talking this morning about um, obstetrics and the, the closure of obstetric units in rural hospitals and community hospitals. And again, GME is really the, the key to addressing these various issues. Oh, Dr. Hildreth, you agree or? I definitely agree, and as you referenced earlier, uh, Senator Sanders, we want to make health care happen in the lowest cost setting possible, and that's certainly outpatient setting for primary care. So I definitely agree that more GME in those settings would be great. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Cassidy? I'm going to defer to Senator Paul. Senator Paul. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zanton, are you uh, pro-choice with regard to patients making individualized medical choices? Uh, 
Broadly, thank you, yes. Are you uh, aware that your university is, uh, doesn't allow choice with regard to vaccination, that you require all of your students to have three vaccines in order to be students? Okay, yes. So it's sort of choice, but not so much when regarding vaccination. Um, are you aware of the increased risk of myocarditis with the COVID vaccine, particularly with successive COVID vaccinations in uh, males between the ages of 16 and 24? Um, Senator, thank you for the question. I, I'm prepared to talk about the nursing crisis and well, that we have yeah. vaccine requirements across the board for well, a lot here's, of Here's the problem. If you exclude everybody from being a nurse who believes in basic immunology, you're going to include a lot of smart people, people who believe that you can get immunity from both vaccination as well as infection. And if you say, well, we're just not going to take the people who believe in that old-fashioned infection thing, providing immunity, we're only going to take the people who will do as they're told. I mean, do you think individuals should be treated the same uh, when they come to the emergency room? If you've got an 18-year-old with chest pain and a 68-year-old obese diabetic with chest pain, do you think they get treated the same in the emergency room? There are differences based on age. We used to always make differences even on the flu vaccine. We, 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 we advised it for people at risk. We've, we've done this forever. This is the first time we've done it, and we're now doing it with an experimental vaccine, one that's not been approved. Do you think that prior infection affects your immunity? Senator, I'm, I'm not, I don't make the choices about the vaccinations. That's at Johns Hopkins University. Right, course, but you're so. a leader at Johns Hopkins University, and you could well have your opinion stated Dr. Marty McCary is there, and Dr. Marty McCary has been very active in this. He has looked at the uh, incidence of myocarditis, and he says it's 28 times more likely to get myocarditis from the vaccine than from COVID for a particular cohort of young men. Uh, women it also applies to, but more men than women. I assume you have men and women in your nursing program. This is a big deal, and it might, it might affect. It affects the Marines, it affects everybody else. We finally fixed it with the Marines. We're not making them do it anymore. But the thing is, is you're at a, in a, an institution of higher learning. We should have questions. And I know yeah, sometimes we have to do as we're told, but you're also dean of the school. You have a voice. And we should be curious about things. In Britain, France, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they don't have university mandates on this. Some countries don't recommend it for children at all. There really is a debate and discussion. You can have an opposite debate, but if you believe in choice, when something has a debate and there's arguments on both sides, you'd give people the choice. So the CDC did a study of a million patients. That's a pretty big study. It's an observational study, but it's a large study. And they asked, what are the chances that you will go to the hospital? And they divided into different groups. One group was vaccination. And it showed a 20 times, and this has been repeated a lot, 20 times lowering of your rate of going to the hospital if you've been vaccinated. And I think most people accept that. Now, it doesn't stop transmission. So when you mandate this, you can't make any arguments about protecting other people. It's only about you at this point. But what they also found in this study of a million people was that people who had not been vaccinated but had been infected on a prior occasion by COVID were 57 times less likely to go, likely to, go to the hospital. So it really, it isn't an argument against vaccination. I mean, if you haven't been infected, you ought to be vaccinated, but you ought to have a choice. You're not giving people any choice, and actually this applies to all your universities, none of your universities, I think you all mandate three vaccines. And frankly, I think the literature actually shows it to be malpractice. That's why you should all have a voice in this. Um, a large study in Israel shows that the rate of myocarditis among vaccinated is about one in 3,000 to one in 6,000. There's another, another study that shows that it's 40 times greater. So between 28 and 40 times. And this isn't an argument against vaccination. It's an argument for thinking and, and understanding that people of different ages could respond differently. And so my hope, and what I would offer to all of you is that people should speak up. We are living in a world where everybody sticks their head in the sand and says, do as you're told, take three vaccines. And there are people with myocarditis that are seriously ill. Currently, I mean, think about this. Here's a question. Your 15-year-old your kid has had, has had COVID, takes the vaccine, and has myocarditis enough to be hospitalized. What would you do? Would you give him another vaccine? Thank you. I'm, I'm not, I will take into consideration what you've said, and I'll bring it back to you. Well, it's an individual office. decision, and you ought to be able to answer, at least be honest and look backwards. The thing is, is the CDC says if your kid's had myocarditis, got sick and went to the hospital, as soon as he gets better, give him another one. 
I think most parents in the country would say that's a stupid idea and defies all common sense, and they would resist this. But when the government tells you to do it, and it's a really stupid idea that defies common sense, guess what? People lose trust in government. People, you, we want to have trust in the people running our medical schools and our nursing schools. But somebody needs to ask these questions. Dr. Marty McCary's doing it. Dr. Vinay Prasad's doing it out at UC San Francisco. And it's a growing movement, but I would hope that you all will open your minds to at least thinking about the choice of the individual in medicine. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Paul. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Cassidy for this hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses. I greatly appreciate what all of you do. Uh, Dr. Stegar, I wanted to start with a question to you. Thank you again for being here and for sharing your expertise on the workforce shortages facing health systems in New Hampshire and all around the country. As we work to address this shortage, we don't want nurses or other healthcare workers to have to leave their jobs to get a degree or credential that they need to advance their career. Last Congress, I worked with Senator Young to introduce the Upskilling and Retraining Assistance Act, which would double the amount of tax-free educational assistance that workers can receive as a benefit from their employers. Dr. Steger, would offering tax-free education benefits help keep healthcare workers in the field and ease the labor shortages facing hospitals and other providers? I, I actually think that's quite a good idea. Uh, it's, I think of it as uh, scholarships from your employer, yeah. right? These are often offered with the agreement that you have a commitment to the employer afterwards, which is a good way rather than doing a loan to, to, to support this. And you keep them in, they tend to take a day off here or there, and they stay connected. Uh, I especially think these are, you know, if, if you had to target this, it should be targeted in places that are uh, where we have particular needs. Sure. That makes sense. Um, let me turn to Dr. Herbert. Um, when I visited with healthcare leaders at Memorial Hospital in North Conway last month, they told me about the challenges that they face every day as a result of the nursing shortage. While it's essential that we train more registered nurses, we also need these nurses to continue to practice in rural areas of states like New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont uh, after they get their license. So how can we encourage nurses trained in rural states to stay and practice there after graduating? So thank you very much for the question. There's, we use a three-pronged approach that we found um, helpful. The first is we try to attract students from rural areas. And what we found is students from rural areas are more likely to go and practice in a rural area, even if it's not their same hometown. Right. So that's the first key. Second, and this is very important, regardless of where they come from, during training, placing them in clinical sites in rural areas. Very, very important. They, they get a taste of rural life, and many of them actually really like small town and rural life and, and prefer to work in those settings. Third and most importantly is something I mentioned before, which is either scholarship or loan repayment programs with strings attached, with a commitment to practice in those areas. You can do it on the front end as scholarships, on the back end as loan repayment, but there needs to be an incentive because, as Chairman Sanders said, if you are looking at a big debt that you need to pay off, and there's a major hospital in Boston that will, you know, uh, give you uh, uh, X additional salary. We need to at least, we don't, even if we don't make up the entire amount, we need to offset that enough to incentivize people to practice in rural areas. That three-pronged approach is, we found it helpful for not only nurses, but dentists and other professionals. Well, I thank you for that response. I'll add that the other piece of the conversation that came up in North Conway and has come up all around my state is just the need for housing for employees, mm -hmm. um, especially in, in rural New England right now, in northern New England. Um, so, Dr. Zanton, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, in response to the growing shortage of licensed nursing assistants, New England College has created a joint nursing education program with Elliott Hospital in Manchester. The college's students earn 25% of their college credits working as licensed nursing assistants at Elliott Hospital. They graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. How can we encourage these kinds of innovative partnerships and other efforts to train and develop more licensed nursing assistants? Because you know, what, what we're finding is these nursing assistants are doing the work they need at the bedside. They're also getting critical clinical experience uh, with oversight from nurses um, in a clinical setting. Absolutely. I think that's a wonderful idea. And, you know, we have such a sh shortage, especially in the hospitals, 
that we're, it's going to take an all, all, all of the above kind of strategy and some you know, training in the clinical places and some in the universities, and um, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Swaney, in December, Congress funded the training of 200 new physicians, including at least 100 psychiatrists or addiction medicine specialists, building off um, a bill that Senator Collins and I did called the Opioid Workforce Act. Dr. Swaney, how will additional psychiatrists help meet the existing behavioral health crisis, and what more can we do to continue developing the behavioral health workforce? Thank you for that question. There's a critical shortage of psychiatrists uh, in the U.S., and in particular in my state. That's why Oxner, we, we have our scholarships around primary care and psychiatrists. Yeah. And psychiatrists are part of a team. Uh, there's psychologists, nurse practitioners, and others that can participate in that. Uh, but that, that program is essential to growing the workforce, and psychiatrists are, you, you know, they are the spearhead to, to help be part of the solution for this mental health crisis that we're facing in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I will once again defer this time to Senator Collins. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Dr. Herbert, I do want to follow up with you on the issue of the shortage of nursing faculty. It just is astonishing to me that last, I guess it was in 2021, almost 92,000 applications for baccalaureate and graduate nursing programs were turned away with faculty shortages cited as the top reason. And the University of Maine this year had 1,239 applications for only 80 slots. So I think there's this misperception that people don't want to become nurses, when in fact, we have a ton of applicants from people who do want to enter the field of nursing, but we don't have the professors to teach them. And that's why the chairman and I and the ranking member have been working hard to come up with a solution. I want to probe more with you on how we bridge the faculty gap. You mentioned in your testimony, Dr. Herbert, uh, that in some cases, practicing clinicians can be recruited to serve as faculty instructors in their existing workplaces. Could you give the committee an example of how UNE is working with an academic institution or a hospital to expand training capacity? So thank you very much, Senator Collins. We're, we're doing exactly that. First of all, I agree with everything you said. It is a real problem. And you're also right that there's a lot of demand out there for people who want to become nurses and other healthcare professionals, and, um, but with limitations in what we can do. At UNE, we have increased the number of nurses. We trained 300% in the past 10 years. So we're continuously looking how we can expand that. Um, a program along the lines that you're describing is something we are doing in partnership with Maine Health. Maine Health is um, Maine's largest um, healthcare network uh, of, of providers and uh, also, in, in, in also has uh, branches in New Hampshire as well, Southern New Hampshire. We, what we're doing is we're actually using the faculty on site, using nurses on site. We provide professional development and support from the university to have them train people on, on site in the main health hospitals, hospital system. So using clinicians, this is part of that laddering approach. So we're also training the, the nurses, upskilling the nurses, going from uh, LPNs to RNs, RNs to BSNs, BSNs to nurse practitioners on site in partnership with um, Maine Health. And we're looking to expand that program with other healthcare programs as well. So trying to find creative ways of addressing the faculty shortage. Thank you. Dr. Steger, I saw you nodding. Did you have something to add? I was just going to say, you know, I, I don't, there's been such strong growth in the number of people going through nursing schools. Applicants have outpaced that, so that's why they're, but the, the thing, you know, and so we shouldn't be surprised there are faculty shortages. It's been chronic because 
we've tripled the number of students going through nursing programs in the last 25 years. That, nobody thought that could happen 25 years ago. It's been heroic what the nursing schools have done, and it is, it's a, it's a chronic problem. I, I also think it's a problem that the nursing schools have been able to solve with help, and, and I'm optimistic going ahead. And we've still got this huge gap uh, Dr. Hildreth, I was very moved by your testimony, and I was reminded of the fact that one reason UNE has been so successful in getting uh, its graduates to practice in rural areas is they do the third year program in rural areas. So do you do something similar to that in order to encourage people to return to underserved areas. Thank you, Senator Collins. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're really happy that the governor of Tennessee, Governor Lee, and the leadership helped us create a program where we recruit students from rural areas to come to university there, and they're admitted into medical school at the same time. It's an accelerated program in which their tuition is paid both undergraduate and medical school, and they've committed to go back and work in the communities they come from. And I think that's a model that should be repeated all over the country. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Collins. Uh, Senator Hickelnupa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all of you for your, your work and your commitment to this at a time when, uh, as, as both the, the chair and the ranking member made so clear in their opening statements, this is a, an emergency, uh, and you all share that sense of urgency. Um, uh, Dr. Swanee, um, while I was governor of Colorado, we worked hard to uh, expand youth apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, I was moved to read the uh, testimony uh, about the different ways Oxner is using apprenticeships to foster uh, interest in uh, medicine and as a workforce solution. I was especially enthusiastic to learn about the Oxner Nursing Pre-Apprenticeship Program which is open to high school sophomores hoping to serve more than 600 students over the next two years. Uh, that really is incredible. Uh, have any of your pre-apprenticeship program graduates remained with Oxner or, or stayed in the field and uh, has opening these programs to high school students helped, you know, do you see a, an impact in, in terms of addressing your, uh, your challenges? Yeah. Thank you very much for that question, Senator. Uh, it's early in the program. We started in 2021. We have currently about 350 apprenticeships in the program. Uh, by, by this fall, we'll have 600 students in the program. So it's early in the program. But, uh, but, we, but this grew out of another program, the MA Now program, which is a program where we went into our communities, underserved communities, where they had high unemployment rates, partnered with our local community partners there to identify applicants for our MA Now program. And then we certified those programs, the, the, the six months training, we trained them, got, they got a certificate program to be an MA. Now we have over 600 of those MA uh, and we hired through that program. The apprenticeship program for us is very important as we launched our Healthy State Initiative, which is you know, Oxford's initiative to do a collective impact in Louisiana to improve our health rankings from 50th, which unfortunately is where we've been 50th or 49th for the last 30 years, to 40th over the next 10 years, high school graduation rate is one of the key factors for our poor health rankings. So this apprenticeship program really gets at two components. One, can we get to our sophomores in high school, keep them in high school by allowing them to work as apprentices to nurses, and therefore pay them some th during high school. And then they get a free year of community college when they finish high school, uh, and then they're an LPN. Um, so we're early on in, uh, in the program, Senator, but we're very enthusiastic about it. Great, well, I'm, I'm very excited about it as well. I've talked to uh, both Senator Cassidy and Senator Sanders about the value of apprenticeships, and looking at that on a broader scale uh, in healthcare. Uh, the pandemic showed us how important it is to address the shortage of public health workers. Uh, and Colorado uh, offers a first of its, of its kind, uh, in a state program called Colorado Public Health Works uh, that connects AmeriCorps volunteers with a registered apprenticeship program run by the Trailhead Institute. This allows AmeriCorps members to gain valuable on-the-job apprenticeship experience while helping meet our public health needs at the same time. And Dr. Steger, how can we 
build out programs like this to help address our larger public health workforce needs. I'm not sure I have great concrete <laughs> advice on that. I think these kind of programs are critical. Everyone's talked about the step, you know, step programs and people going, you know, there wasn't, didn't used to be a career ladder here that for people to get trained and gradually move up from medical assistant to RN to NP, et cetera. So I think the more we can encourage that, the better. I still think this is best done by providers, right? They're the most close to the ground. They can uh, figure this out. So providing them with the resources and incentives right. to develop these programs. But facilitating also, I think, using resources like AmeriCorps and making yeah. sure that you can facilitate yeah. that connection. That's exactly um, Dr. Hiller, I uh, do, well, I'll, leave, I'll go on to the next one. <laughs> I can get carried away. Uh, Dr. Herbert, I was going to ask you about the IPE um, and the, uh, that uh, effort. Well, let's, let's, I'll, I'll skip. I'll, I'll give that a written question. Just know that I'm very attracted to appreciate the IPE model. And I think the collaboration and, and what it allows providers is a big thing. I'll, I will go to Dr. Hildreth. And uh, you've spoken about the critical needs in terms of you know, the, how important it is to increase diversity. I've been on a number of roundtables where uh, the, the, the small numbers of not just doctors, but midwives and, and, and in terms of uh, how an uh, expectant mother is taken care of, really uh, uh, women of color don't get offered the same choices. Right. Uh, and the only way we're going to change that is really to change the, the makeup of who are attending mm -hmm. to them. Um, how can we foster programs and encourage uh, early exposure, um, this kind of early exposure at the federal level that makes sure that, that younger kids see a, a role for them in healthcare? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, what we've done at Meharry is we've adopted two middle schools. Uh, and what we do is we make sure that our students in medical school, dental school, and our graduate programs are present with those kids to show them that it is possible for them because they see students in professional programs that look like them and we think this is a very powerful way to get students engaged early on and keep them engaged by having our students interact with them. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for the Thank question. You. Thank you. I yield back. Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Senator Romney. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, I, I um, was struck by the uh, chairman's opening comments that we spend so much per person in this country. Health results are not that much different. We spend almost double as much as the people in the average uh, developed nation per, in, in health care. Uh, sometimes we in Washington think, well, the answer is to spend more. But I would suggest that there must be a different approach. If we're already spending almost twice as much as everybody else, then there's got to be some other reason uh, that we're not able to provide the, the quality uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost that we'd like to do. Um, I, I note that my prior experience in the, in, in the private sector showed that almost everything that we buy gets better and better, better quality and lower cost in real terms over time, and that productivity increases over time. And the exception to that are really three major areas, healthcare, education, and the military. Those happen to be three areas that are dominated by government. So I think I have an idea as to where the problem lies and would suggest the right answer is, is not more government. In this case, I think we can look at healthcare and say, we've, what's the old Pogo cartoon? I've met the enemy and the enemy is us. And uh, one aspect of that enemy uh, relates to immigration. My understanding is that typically almost 20% of the nurses and medical professionals in this country come from foreign countries. Uh, but the backlog of medical professionals that want to come into this country has become enormous. We require them to be interviewed, and given our security needs, it's appropriate that they be interviewed by the State Department. But apparently the State Department is still so concerned about COVID that they're not interviewing these people. And so places like the Philippines, where there are some 30,000 people who want to come here and serve as nurses, we can't get those nurses in. Are, are you aware of this, of this feature? Uh, again, by the president of uh, the college and uh, the University of New England, are, are you aware of the, uh, the fact that our, our government is just not doing the interviews necessary to bring people in that would help dramatically reduce our, our, uh, our nursing shortage? So, Senator Romney, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not aware of that. I'm not up on that particular issue with the interviews, but if I, I mean, to be happy to speak to, because I agree with you about the importance of immigrants um, in our healthcare workforce. So more broadly, if I can just very quickly say, um, 
One of the things we need is programs like we're doing at UNE in our pharmacy school and our dental school, which are programs that are accelerated programs that take foreign trained dentists or pharmacists or doctors for that matter, and then help them become eligible for American licensure. So to meet the requirements so they can sit for their exams and become eligible. So these accelerated programs are very valuable and because we have professionals who are um, legal, they have green cards, they're in some cases citizens, and who could work but can't work in their field that they were trained. They may have been a surgeon for 20 years in, in a foreign country, but, and these are often people of color from the developing world. So we've developed programs in that regard. But then you also have, and, and just in the case of Maine, to give you an example, we have a lot of asylum seekers from Africa, and they are sitting in hotel rooms and um, can't work, and they let's, want to work. Yeah, let's, let's, let's interview these people. Let's stop allowing our government workers to work from home, yeah. saying because they have COVID, we can't allow you to come back to the workplace. You can't do the interviews of these people right. who want to come to our country and fill the desperate needs we have in healthcare. If we have a nursing shortage and a doctor shortage, let's let those who are in line that are qualified come here. And I agree with you with regards to the education programs. I'd note with regards to educating our own citizens here, uh, the work that you're doing in your respective institutions is critical. Um, there's one in, um, in, in the western part of our country called Western Governors University. You're probably familiar with it. It graduates more nurses than any other institution of higher learning in the country. Its tuition, uh, Mr. Chairman, is $6,700 uh, every six months. Very reasonable uh, tuition compared to the cost in most, most places. Uh, 126,000 students at Western Governors University. It's a not-for-profit. It was established by uh, former Governor Mike Levitt and the governors of five other Western states. Uh, we have the capacity to educate. They can take on more students at reasonable cost. Um, so the approach is that we can learn from one another and, and expand the best practices that, are, that we're seeing in some places. But legal immigrants following the legal process where the State Department does the job they need to do and doesn't stay home because of COVID will allow us to dramatically reduce the shortage that we're seeing in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Chair Sanders and Ranking Member Cassidy, thank you for making this the first hearing of this committee in the 118th Congress. I think this issue is huge and challenging, but one that's very amenable to some bipartisan work that can be done. Senator Romney beat me to the punch. Not the first time, because I wanted to talk about immigration. I was, I was interested that in none of the opening testimony was this put on the table as a potential solution, although I think in some of your written testimony, a couple of you mentioned it. Just to give you numbers on this. According to the Migration Policy Institute, as of 2018, the foreign born comprise almost 18% of the 14.7 million people in the US who work in healthcare, nearly one in five. The foreign born make up a disproportionate share of certain both high and low skilled healthcare workforces. 28% of our physicians and surgeons are foreign born and 38% of our home health aides were born outside the United States. And this isn't just about employment based immigration. It's also focused on family and humanitarian immigration systems. So another statistic, more than 310,000 healthcare workers 12% of the immigrants who are employed in healthcare occupations are not here on work-related visas. They're here for humanitarian reasons, resettled refugees, asylees, special immigrant visa holders, TPS recipients, recipients in Cuban and Haitian entrants. So President Herbert, you've already addressed this with Senator Romney, but what could we do with an immigration reform uh, that's focused on healthcare or other critical workforce areas that would make all of your jobs easier in educating uh, a diverse and, and sufficiently sized healthcare workforce. So Senator Kane, thank you very much. I, first of all, I, I should say I'm not an immigration expert. I make no pretense to be, um, but I echo your concerns. I think that there's no question that immigrants disproportionately go into healthcare at various levels. Um, they're very hard workers, they want to work, and I can tell you from personal experience, at least locally, what, what I see is a lot of folks who want to work, they're here legally, but they're not able to work because of um, uh, arcane regulations that really should be changed. And so 
I, yeah, we, we need, and we, frankly, we need to encourage immigration in a state like Maine where um, we are losing native population and the only way our population is, is staying stable and even growing is through immigration. And, and there's many new Mainers who want to work and are not able to. My, my perception, and I don't have the data on this, but my perception in Virginia is that the foreign-born healthcare workforce is also more likely to work in rural Virginia. If I talk Absolutely. to physicians in Appalachia, they're more likely to be foreign-born than if I'm doing it where I live in Richmond or metropolitan, um, other metropolitan areas of the state. Um, I have other topics I want to get to, but does anyone else, else want to weigh in on immigration issues? Yes, Dr. Hildreth. Senator Kane, thank you for the question. Uh, I have nothing against bringing in uh, foreign-born folks to work in our healthcare enterprise. We have lots of talent we've not tapped into in our own country here. For example, it used to be that 26% of all the black students who went to medical school came from HBCUs. is now less than 10%. Why is that? Because we've underinvested, under-resourced those schools. So I would submit to you but that by properly resourcing the schools we have, we can fill a lot of that gap with native-born talent right here in the United States. Thank you. I, I have a piece of legislation that is called the Expanding Medical Education Act, which I'm going to reintroduce this Congress. I introduced it in the last. That's very focused on HBCUs and other minority-serving institutions. In, in your testimony, and then Dr. Is it Swanee? Dr. Swanee's testimony, you both laid out some innovative programs you're doing and the need for additional investment. I completely agree with that. Let me ask a question about the direct care workforce shortage, or just bring it to the attention of the committee. Um, our direct care workforce shortage is often left out of the conversation about healthcare workforce shortages. Direct care professionals make an average of $11.75 an hour. They're some of the lowest paid workers in the economy, but they provide difficult hands-on care to seniors and people with disabilities. And this workforce shortage kind of compounds other shortages. I go to hospital emergency rooms and they say, we have to keep people in hospitals longer because the direct care workforce shortage means that there's no placements where we can discharge someone from a hospital to a long-term care setting or to appropriate home health care aid. So I hope as we look at this problem, uh, we'll focus on the direct uh, care workforce. F finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, uh, introduce a letter for the record. Johnson & Johnson wrote a letter to thank Senator Cassidy and I and the whole committee for a bill we passed, the Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, which is to provide mental health resources to frontline healthcare work workers. One of the ways we'll keep a robust healthcare workforce is making sure that they have the resources they need to be resilient. I'd like to introduce that letter for the record if I could. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kane. Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Dr. Marshall, who for the first time in two weeks is not wearing Kansas City chief colors. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ranking Member and Chairman. I want to just remind folks that Kansas has two nationally ranked basketball teams in the top 10, and it's time to move on to basketball season. But I, I am honored to be here today to talk about an issue near and dear to my heart. This is uh, the dream, the nightmare that I've lived the last 40 years of my life. There's been a physician shortage in rural America for at least 40 years. There's been a nursing shortage in rural America for at least 20 years. So the challenge before me as a person operating a, a private practice in rural America has been to recruit doctors and then is running a hospital is recruiting nurses. Um, myself, I, I went back to rural America. One of the reasons was, was I had a scholarship, a state-sponsored tuition scholarship if I would go back to an underserved area. My partner uh, was a recipient of a National Health Service Corps uh, loan uh, as well and, and was able to repay it. So those are certainly you know, some of the things that are working. I want to talk about nursing shortage for just a second. 80% of the nurses could come from community colleges. Let me say that, say that a different way. 80% of the jobs in healthcare could be done with community college nurses. Community colleges are the answer to the nursing shortage. Those uh, folks are typically uh, from, the, from a small town. They're going to go to that small town community college. They're more likely to stay in that small town. Of all the students from my hometown that went off to the university medical school, I could maybe count on my hand the ones that came back. Uh, there was a four-year program in, in Fort Hayes, a rural, a, more of a rural community program. Those folks were more likely to stay back. But once 
those young nurses taste the life in the big city. They, they like it, and they stay there. So as we think about going forward, I hope we can come back and, and talk to the community colleges, nursing programs a little bit more. What can we do to accentuate them? And the small colleges as well. Uh, there's quite a few small colleges with good four-year programs as, as well. Um, by the way, their, their uh, student debt is maybe a fourth or a fifth of what a person coming to a university would be. I'll talk about physician shortage just for a second. We'll go on the other end of the spectrum. A lot of our physicians are leaving the market right now because of burnout. Uh, issues like prior authorization, surprise billing, our ER doctors have just been overworked and underpaid, if, if you will, but mostly they're burned out. Uh, they're getting burned out on the, with the surprise billing issues um, and, and just, you know, frankly, just the, the COVID epidemic just, just overwhelmed the system and those folks are leaving, leaving like we've never seen them before. Um, nurses, again, you know, though we forced them to take a vaccine, some of them didn't like that, and, and certainly they were burned out a, as well. I, anyone want to speak to, to burnout in, in the profession? Just want to go ahead. I'll speak to it. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Senator Marshall. Uh, look, I, I think what sometimes we forget when we're not on the front lines of health care every day is that the pandemic for us for, for many of us, we can go and turn off our TV and go back home or work from home or, or, or work from our offices, and we can get away from the pandemic. We can get away from those stressors. For those frontline nurses and those frontline physicians, they can never get away from the pandemic. It's day in, day out, and it takes a toll. It's an impact on, on ill people, death and dying, uh, and it's been a marathon for them, not a sprint, and that marathon continues. I think we, we've got to work on ways that we can improve the working environment. Uh, and it's been a more violent working environment, as there's been more verbal and physical assaults on health care providers. Uh, to that end, uh, I think at Oxnard, We've really taken the approach of we have a wellness office. Uh, we've provided a lot of wellness programs for our nurses and physicians. Um, we also work with our state legislators in the state of Louisiana to make uh, violence in, in the healthcare workplace a felony uh, and also training our, our, our workforce on de escalation techniques. Uh, but we have to be proactive uh, in this area. And then I think the other thing, and speaking with the nursing programs, is we got to develop innovative new ways to think of respite for our frontline nurses. So one of the if things- you can, I'm sorry, I'm going to run out of time. I'm sorry. So those are, I'm going to quickly talk, though, about residency programs. Where, where Kansas loses our doctors and our medical students is residency programs. We don't have specifically enough primary care doctor slots. And one of the challenges I see is that Orthopedic residencies are a money maker for hospitals, so the hospitals are willing to fund them, but primary care is not a money maker for hospitals, and consequently they don't want to fund them. They want more government funding. So just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm over time. Quickly address uh, just how, how a, a big medical center hospitals look at primary care residencies as opposed to, say, a specialty uh, that residency that makes money. Yeah. <laughs> Well, primary care doctors are essential for any large health system, and especially a group practice integrated health system like ours, primary care doctors are key. So we, we value them as much as we value our orthopedists. And as, as Senator Sanders already mentioned, I think being able to fund community-based clinic primary care to expand our funding for primary care residencies, we, we'd be very excited about that. Thank, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Um, Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, uh, thanks to our witnesses, um, and thanks for focusing upon the, the critical health care issues that are facing our country today. Uh, Massachusetts is uh, renowned for its top research institutions and its second to none health care system. Um, and it creates an ecosystem for innovation and for care. But at the same time, even in Massachusetts, there are 19,000 positions sitting empty in acute care uh, at hospitals. Half of all licensed practical nurse positions at acute care hospitals sit empty. For home care aides, mental health workers, social workers, paramedics, one in three of those jobs is empty in Massachusetts. 
So I appreciate the concerns I'm hearing from more rural states, but we have the exact same set of issues. Uh, and it's an urgent crisis. Uh, patients are facing long wait times for an annual uh, 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 well visit. Kids are sitting in adult emergency rooms for hours, days, weeks, waiting for mental health treatment in Massachusetts. People trying to get help uh, meet deadly delays in access to opioid use disorder treatment like methadone medication and the healthcare system strains under the weight of surges like the COVID pandemic and natural disasters. Meanwhile, our healthcare heroes who get into their careers to help people in their greatest hour of need are facing their own hour of need. The current system is forcing them to make impossible choices when faced with huge caseloads, immense pressure, intense burnout. So advocates in healthcare unions across the country are fighting to make sure we can keep our workers on the job through better pay and safer working conditions. But without enough of these critical workers, healthcare centers are closing their doors, turning people away, happening in Massachusetts, or forcing patients to wait in line for care. So we have to make sure that we care for our healthcare workers. So let me ask you, Dr. Herbert, uh, I'm hearing over and over again that children are waiting for behavioral health services. Uh, people are having trouble getting treatment for substance use disorder. Uh, for people in rural communities, in western Massachusetts, uh, or in northern New England, um, obviously these prob problems are very real. Can you talk about that and what you would recommend as a solution? Absolutely, and let me begin by saying that I completely agree with you. Um, my comments largely focusing on rural, the underserved areas in rural areas, um, they're absolutely, and as, as the chairman in his introductory comments mentioned, there are underserved areas in urban areas as well um, that are just as acute and, and problematic. Um, in terms of behavioral health, we need, there's a number of things that we need. The first thing I would say is, there is a critical shortage of psychiatrists, but we are not, we're never going to train enough psychiatrists to meet the psychiatric needs of underserved areas. It's just, I just don't see it happening in the next decade. Um, there are answers though, for example, nurse practitioners. So we can train more nurse practitioners in psychiatric, um, uh, to be psychiatric nurse practitioners, and we're developing precisely one of those programs right now. So there's, we need the, the full range of behavioral investments in the full range of behavioral health services, all the way from psychiatry, nurse practitioners, down to, in some states like Maine, there are opportunities for a credential for undergraduates with an undergraduate degree to work in behavioral health. Most states don't have that. We do, I think more states should, so that you can actually at entry level mental health positions behavioral health in nursing homes, in, in various kinds of community settings, schools, um, with a, just a bachelor's degree even. So we need investments across the board. Yeah, no question. My wife is a psychiatrist, so I appreciate this mental health crisis that we have in our country right now. Um, uh, we have a climate crisis as well, and climate can impact upon a community's health care resources. So uh, uh, Dr. Swanee, could you talk about that in Louisiana? Yeah, unfortunately, because of our geographic location, we're no strangers to hurricanes, and we, we, we've we dealt them. I have grew up in New Orleans, so I've dealt with them for a long time, and we continue to deal with them. Um, it, it's, it's unfortunately part of uh, our way of life down on the Gulf Coast, and we just look at ways to be resilient and adaptive. And how difficult is it, given the, the sometimes catastrophic uh, events that you have to deal with? Uh, I think it's it's quite obvious that you know we deal with this, and um, I will say it brings the community together, and and of course it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Markey. Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Senator Bud. Thank the chair. Thank the ranking member. So I've heard firsthand from patients, doctors, nurses, uh, in hospitals all around North Carolina about ongoing workforce challenges. I think we need to focus on preparing future healthcare workforce. For example, some Wake Forest Early College of Health and Sciences partners with Wake Tech Community College and Wake Med to provide students with hands-on experience, certifications, and even college credit. 
So in the House of Representatives, I led the Critical Health Care Careers Act. Uh, the bill would help community colleges prepare the next generation of healthcare workers. Students should have the opportunity to gain on-the-job experience to prepare them for careers in healthcare. So Dr. Swanee, what steps is your health system in Louisiana taking to offer new credentials and educational opportunities for workers to join the healthcare workforce? Thank you for that question. Um, I mentioned the MA Now program, which is one where we partner with our communities where there's high unemployment or underemployment to introduce uh, workers into the health system through the medical assistant uh, job. And then it's about upskilling, as Senator Cassidy has mentioned. Uh, we, we like to call it earn as you learn, uh, or the ladders. Uh, um, and then taking those MAs and then working with our community colleges to be able to, as they work, support them, give them free tuition to be able then to become LPNs, associate degrees. And then now we're working with our with our university partners for them to be able to have bachelor's degrees. So that story that Senator Cassie shared with us is, is exactly what we're trying to do by getting more entry level into healthcare and then being able to meet our healthcare needs. And it's a win-win across the board, right? We're leveraging the human capital of the state of Louisiana and Mississippi, um, but we're also giving people a living wage for them to raise their family. Thank you. Uh, so in your, earlier in your testimony, I understand that you mentioned using non-physician providers like uh, CNAs, licensed practical nurses. Uh, do you agree that maintaining access to services delivered by non-physicians, such as testing, treatment, vaccinations at local pharmacies, you think that's an important part of addressing healthcare workforce shortage? You know, medicine is a team. It's a team effort. Uh, physicians are a very important part of that team, but many other providers are also an extremely important part of that team, so I agree. Yeah. So what steps do you think institutions can take? I know you're from the Louisiana perspective, but as you think about all the way to North Carolina, um, what can institutions do to better prepare healthcare workers to serve patients outside of a traditional hospital setting? Um, I'm thinking in-home, telehealth, um, community health centers, or anything else? Yeah, health healthcare is shifting to outpatient. Uh, and one of the things we need to do is to be able to be innovative about how we care for more patients, and it's already been mentioned uh, at this committee, at lower cost settings. Uh, so as we can transition an inpatient stay to a home stay, if, as we can leverage a medical home model where we can have digital tools, telehealth tools, uh, to for a patient who may have stayed in the hospital three days, now it can stay two days. That obviously opens up more hospital beds to care for more acute patients, but it's also a more family patient friendly model as we transition to more of this medical home model. So I, we would agree with that, and we currently are pursuing innovative models that we, we can do that. Thank you very much. I'd like to yield back to the ranking member. Uh, so, thank you very much. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panel of witnesses. Uh, really appreciate the uh, conversation that we're having today. Um, I wanted to uh, start uh, and raise once again an issue that uh, came up in uh, previous questioning relating to violence uh, and harassment faced uh, by healthcare providers and how that impacts the question that we're tackling today. A recent study found that more than two-thirds of nurses reported experiencing verbal abuse and 44% reported being subject to physical violence. Last year, I was proud to reintroduce the Workplace Violence Prevention for Healthcare and Social Service Workers Act. This act would require healthcare and social service employers to write and implement workplace violence prevention plans to prevent and protect their employees from uh, violent incidents. Violence against healthcare workers is totally unacceptable, and we need, I think, to do more uh, to provide protection. Uh, Dr. Zanton, I, I would like to ask you to uh, reflect on how violence against uh, healthcare workers contributes to uh, reduction of staffing levels, uh, burnout, uh, 
and, and the consequences of reduced staffing for patient safety. But since Dr. Swanee also raised this, um, I would, would like to call on you additionally to comment. Thank you for the question, Senator. Absolutely, it's an issue. I think, you know, we're in the middle of a mental health crisis and a substance use crisis. And the way that the country feels more and more fractured, I think all of those together add to, you know, I talk to nurses who say, I used to be the hero walking into their room, and I used to have just respect based on being a nurse. And now I don't always get that and suffer verbal abuse and sometimes physical abuse. I do think that it's been mentioned that hospitals are going to shrink and become more and more, you know, operating rooms and intensive care units, and that almost everything else will happen out in the community. I do think that when people are at home and in their community and in lower cost settings and more family centered settings, that some of that will um, dissipate. Thank you. Dr. Swanee. I will say it's uh, 28 years of practicing medicine, including my training, uh, and I've never seen such a charged environment as uh, every day throughout our health system um, at our safety huddle, or our daily safety huddle, there's an issue around either verbal or physical abuse to a healthcare provider. So it is a true crisis. Uh, um, and, you know, we've, like I said, we've been working with our state legislators to make sure that uh, it's a felony. Uh, we've we've put up signage, uh, um, and also, it's not just the the as you've pointed out the physical abuse, but the verbal abuse. So part of that state uh, uh, bill was that if you interrupt the ability to deliver health care by being verbally abusive, uh, uh, that that also uh, is, is now a crime. So, well, it also sounds like uh, you said your uh, health care system is taking proactive uh, uh, steps. Um, we want to see that uh, more uniform around the country. Um, I also, uh, turning to a different topic, I've been proud to lead the Bipartisan Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act with my colleague, Senator Capito. The bill would grow, improve, and sustain the palliative and hospice care workforce. Um, it addresses each aspect of the healthcare workforce pipeline. Importantly, the bill provides grants to schools of medicine and teaching hospitals to train physicians who plan to teach and establishes fellowship programs uh, to give providers the opportunity to learn more about providing palliative and hospice care. Um, Dr. Swanee, could you briefly describe why it's important for academic health systems to provide physicians with both training to teach and opportunities to build their skills, upskill. And as a follow-up, how does additional training support uh, uh, or alleviate burnout? Senator DeVal, thank you very much for that question, because 15 years ago, I created a uh, course to train residents in the intensive care unit around death and dying and palliative care. And in that course, we, we taught residents with real cases, cases they had experienced during their month in the intensive care unit. And we had a debrief at the end where we went through, you know, what they learned, but really kind of an emotional reset for them. And there was some real critical learnings from that. One of them was, while we were teaching them skills about having how to have difficult conversations and how to manage patients that are critically ill, we quickly learned that one of the most important parts of the course was actually the benefit to the residents would be able to debrief the mental health and wellness for the residents to be able to be able to speak about what they had experienced uh, in, in that month. Because remember, for many of these young medical students and residents, that's their first experience with death, death and dying. So it has an incredible benefit to the wellness of our, of our healthcare workers, and, and, and I've experienced that firsthand uh, through that course. Um, and I, I want to thank you for putting that legislative force. Uh, we're trying to start our own fellowship in palliative care. That's the next program that we actually are going to start. Uh, and it's critically important for the way we practice medicine as, as our population ages. Uh, it's, it's critically important, not just for our healthcare providers, that we be able to provide the appropriate care for patients uh, in their time of need. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Bowman. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for this hearing today. As you and I have discussed, um, 
workforce within uh, health care is, is something that is critically important. Um, we both come from rural states, and uh, when I think about the, the challenges that we face um, in providing health care in a big state geographically with small population um, and the many challenges that we face, we can, we can overcome a lot of that, but if we don't have the trained workforce, um, it just doesn't come together. So uh, don't take my lack of, of chair time here as an indicator that I am not interested in, in addressing the challenges that we face in this. We've got competing hearings this morning, and so I've been jumping in between. Um, but one of the ways that we have been trying to facilitate better access to care in, in a remote place like Alaska, where 80% of our communities are not connected by a road, is telehealth. Um, we're working on the broadband to, to connect everybody so that that telehealth actually is more than just the, just the device, but it actually works. And uh, I know that this subject has been raised, um, but I, I'd ask you, Dr. Swanee, uh, apparently you had mentioned a pilot program for virtual nursing education. So in other words, this is a big challenge for us in Alaska. We've got a nursing program, but how you get the teachers to teach it, can more be done with, with the nursing education programs um, for telehealth as opposed to just how we're thinking about telehealth generally? Yeah, thank you for that question, Senator Murkowski. Uh, uh, look, telehealth is a critical component for how do we reach our rural communities and address some of this, uh, in including on mental health, where there are many good models. And with the pandemic, uh, we saw about a four or five hundred percent increase in telehealth use during the pandemic. And we're able to demonstrate effective care for, for many patients using telehealth. Um, so I think we've learned a lot from the pandemic. Um, on the nursing side, our virtual nursing program really is a, a not an education program, although there is some learnings for the bedside nurse, as it is a patient-facing uh, program. And so there's a bunker where we 24-hour uh, monitor the patients, and that allows the nurse then to be at the, at the clinics, at the bedside, caring for the patient. And all of that electronic health medical records and a lot of that administrative work can be done by the nurses in the bunker. And for instance, a good example would be uh, upon discharge, uh, which could be an arduous process of all the paperwork to discharge. The bunker can do a lot of the administrative and all the discharge work, while the bedside nurse can just do the clinical work, and we can quickly facilitate transitions from a patient from the hospital to their home. Um, so we haven't done a lot of the, on the telehealth education uh, on the nursing side other than that program. And like I said, the, good, the, the education component is that bunker also can work with the bedside nurse as an as a education part. Let me, let me ask a little bit um, different question, and again, it, it speaks to some of, the, some of the ways that we are addressing healthcare challenges in Alaska. Um, we, uh, we rely a lot on um, EMS, EMTs. I was just, just visiting with a woman from Chicken, Alaska. Chicken has probably never been a population of more than 100 people, um, probably uh, won't be, but her son is an EMT there, and basically what they do is, is they work to make sure that anybody, anybody out there uh, can be trained in, uh, in, in emergency services. But I understand that right now we have a significant shortage of EMS professionals. Studies have found that less than 20% of, of EMS organizations, at least in Alaska, have an adequate level of staff across the nation. Turnover of EMS professionals hovers near 30 percent. Very few stay in their role long enough to establish the stability that they need. What, what more do we need to do in this area? We've been talking about everything else, but what about emergency medical services? Dr. Herbert, you're nodding. I don't know who to direct this to, so I'll just throw it out there. Thank you. I, um well, I was just agreeing with you. I, was, I tend to nod. I, okay. I'm not a good poker player. So, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I will, I, first of all, I completely agree with you about EMS. And so there, there are many of us, I'm sure my colleagues on the panel are responding by, by strengthening our programs in that regard. And we have a robust 
uh, program at, at my university. Um, but if I could speak briefly about the telehealth piece, because mm -hmm. I completely agree with you, we face the same challenges in Maine. The last time you and I talked was in Reykjavik, and there are people in Iceland and in Scandinavia that are really leading the world in terms of telehealth um, developments. And so we have a lot to learn from those, those folks. And we, and telehealth is, is exploding in terms of beyond just telehealth, digital medicine, being able to monitor chronic conditions remotely and feed that information back in real time to providers. And then in terms of rural settings, people think of telehealth being from the provider to the patient, but it's also the provider back to the tertiary care medical center to get the consultation that they need. Tremendous work going on in this. What I would simply add is that we need to make sure that our regulations, the state level regulations, um, licensing boards, accrediting bodies, government reimbursement, that it keeps up. Um, so we saw some, some positive changes during the pandemic. We need to make sure that those are sustained. Um, but there's, my concern is that with the incredible innovation that's going on, and this really is going to be transformative over the next 10 years, that these, our, our, these entities are going to fall behind and, and it creates tension and, and delays the, the full utilization of telehealth and digital medicine. Thank you. I'm well over my time, so uh, thank you all. And we will we'll probably be following up on, on some, some of the telehealth conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smith, you're recognized for questions. Thank you, Chair Lujan, and um, thank you to all of you for being here. I want to just uh, note uh, my good friend, um, Senator Murkowski, and I have worked a lot on rural health care issues together, so I appreciate your questions about that. And both of us have large areas of um, rural communities in our states, though I think Alaska trumps Minnesota um, in, in, in some ways on that. So I just want to thank you for your questions there. And I'm grateful for this hearing and the bipartisan spirit of this hearing. So I'd like to start by focusing on the mental health uh, care workforce. Um, you know, even before the pandemic, we knew that there was a growing need for mental health services and the pandemic has, I think, shown a light on the deep need and made the need bigger. Um, um, HRSA estimates that by 2025, we will need an additional 250,000 um, mental health professionals from psychiatrists and mental health and substance abuse, substance use disorder specialists, school psychologists, school counselors. Um, and of course, as Senator um, Murkowski is pointing out rural communities are much more likely to have a shortage of mental health professionals and people of color are much, much more likely to live in places where there is a shortage of mental health care. Um, so today we're talking about the barriers that are facing people who want to get into this field and one of them is money. Um, uh, this morning I reint reintroduced my bipartisan bill, the Mental Health Professionals Workforce Shortage Loan Repayment Act. You do not need to remember the name, just remember the idea, um, with Senators Murkowski and Hassan. And what our bill would do is to provide student loan repayment for mental health professionals who want to practice in places where there are shortages. So um, Dr. Herbert, if I could start with you, could you talk about the importance of um, loan repayment programs? You said how important it was that they were strategic in your opening remarks. I'd like, you to, I'd like to hear more about that and tell us what you think we should have in our minds as we uh, design and move these um, student loan repayment programs. Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, completely agree with you about the mental health crisis. and. Uh, it's important that there, there's a number of things to say about this. First of all, we need to make sure that we train people in primary care who are not mental health specialists yeah. to do mental health first aid, to be able to, people in our schools, for example, teachers, mm -hmm. to be able to recognize and be able to make appropriate referrals. So that's one piece that's there. In terms of loan repayment programs, these can work very, very well if they're done strategically. So just to give you one example, the chairman mentioned dentistry before, and we haven't talked a lot about that today. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible partnership with um, Delta Dental, Northeast Delta Dental, for loan repayment programs for dental graduates who decide to set up shop in underserved rural areas. Right. And we've been able to place in the five years, five graduating classes of our new dental school, we've been able to place um, about 20 dentists in very, very remote rural uh, communities that didn't have dentists before. So with regard to mental health, it's the exact same thing. We just need to make sure that we're targeting 
that, that there's a, a strong contingency where they need to practice in underserved areas, either rural or urban areas. And it's not just, um, I mean, I, I'm great about loan repayment programs in general, but to be maximally effective, they have to target underserved areas. Yeah, exactly. And I appreciate your comment about um, um, uh, uh, training in primary care because you know, our brains and our bodies are connected. It's one person, one body, and we too often um, segment out um, our mental health care from our physical health care in ways that are not good for our overall health care. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Hildreth, I so appreciated your testimony, um, which I was able to hear before I went off to other committees, um, about the crucial role that historically black medical schools play and the assets that you have when it comes to relationships and expertise um, um, and, and trust. And I wonder if you could just, and also, I mean, you, you very well pointed out the disparities that you experience in terms of um, the resources that you have available to build on your mission. So I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that and maybe, um, uh, you know, I care a lot and have focused a lot on the great disparities in maternal health care, um, maternal morbidity, um, the disparities between black women and white women and how that kind of pans out as you think about the practices and the people that you work with. Senator Smith, thank you for the question. And clearly, as, as we've alluded to earlier, when the provider can relate to the patient in terms of culture, race, and all of that, the outcomes are better. There are studies to show that black women who are cared for by black OBs have better outcomes, and our babies do as well. But it all comes back to what I said earlier. We are, have been training healthcare professionals who are really competent and skilled, connected to their communities for decades. But our challenge is the infrastructure we have to do that. What we teach and how we teach it has changed dramatically. And majority institutions have been able to keep up with that change, but we don't have the resources, for example, to do small group teaching as opposed to sage on a stage. Standing in front of 100 students in a lecture hall is a great way to teach, but it's a terrible way to learn. Mm -hmm. So we need to change how we teach this. We like to do that at our institutions, but we don't have the resources to do it. So I would just submit again that if you gave us those resources, the payoff would be tremendous for the country. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll defer to Senator Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I come from the world of uh, fixing issues. I ran a company for 37 years. It was so little. Many of the issues didn't even come to the forefront because you were worried about turning the lights on in the morning, off in the evening, and all the stuff that happened in between. So lucky enough to take a little hard scrabble company and turn it into a national distribution logistics company. Biggest thing I wrestled with once we got larger was the high cost of health care. And now we've not only got that to contend with, we've got the issue of how are you going to get people into the business of it when it's the largest sector of our economy. Travel, all 92 counties in Indiana, workforce, workforce, workforce. It was a bigger issue now than it was pre-COVID, and that's what I heard mostly pre-COVID. I can say one thing, if you give good benefits, you uh, pay your people well, uh, folks come to your door to work there. Uh, I weigh in on those issues a lot, and every company is going to find its own way to do that. But let's look at this issue. I don't think that we'd want to look to the federal government to take on something so granular when currently we borrow 30% of every dollar we spend here. I don't know if you know that. It was about 20% when I got here just four years ago. Terrible long-term business plan. We're not going to be able to solve anything by borrowing money from our kids and grandkids, and that's what this place does. Let me turn my attention to what I think would work. I think companies, uh, I think the healthcare industry, let's focus in on what we're talking about, has now become so top heavy uh, where doctors, the practitioners, are wondering if they, it was even worth it to get their degree. Uh, nurses as well, analogous to farmers in big egg, um, had a startup recently in Indiana where 
a bunch of anesthesiologists and uh, surgeons uh, wanted to start their own practice. It was almost impossible to do. Most of them got fired from their hospital they were working for. Let me tell you what they were able to do. They were able to take a gallbladder removal that cost 21 grand in Indiana if you were covered with insurance, 32,000, that's bizarre, if you didn't have insurance but could afford to pay for it, they're doing it for $8,000. So, and they're gonna pay themselves twice as much in terms of fees. That is what's gotta change basically, or you're not gonna have anybody wanting to get into the industry. And until you fix the industry itself with competition, transparency, removing the barriers to entry, making it entrepreneurial, the whole idea of getting people to work within it is almost gonna be a secondary consideration. So now let's get to the matter of what we're talking about here, workforce in a broken industry, how do you improve upon it? Well, number one, I wouldn't look to this place. Uh, that ought to be something that would be easy among the people in the business. If you're occupying 18 to 20% of our GDP, you ought to be making some effort to do workforce through your own businesses, which now is mostly hospitals, over 40%. Uh, pharma's 15%. Practitioners are shrinking because they're going on the payroll of hospitals. And then you got insurance, which is kind of the Darth Vader of the whole industry in terms of getting to any of this getting fixed. I would say, because uh, I wrestled, I was on our school board locally for 10 years, this ought to be something we're doing better K through 12. Uh, look at the parents that regret that they didn't have some guidance somewhere along the way in high school or back in middle school that don't pursue a four-year degree when only 35% of the jobs need it. I get 10 people show up for that when I got one open. I'm lucky on a Friday if three people come in for a job that would pay as much as most four-year degrees that they show up on Monday. And we got to get that figured out. Better guidance in high school, starting to take high demand, high wage jobs, which nurses would be one of them. Doctors, if you can put up with how long it takes to be educated and not to be frustrated once you become one, we need to do that back there where you live within your means and you get results. Dr. Sewani, I'd like you to comment and anybody else fairly briefly. Should we be doing more here? or is a solution getting better value when they're in K through 12, especially middle school through high school for the problems we're dealing with and talking about here? I think partnerships are important. I think we need to work together. Um, and, and we've done some of the programs you've described that's exactly what we've kind of done. We've, do, we've got the high school apprenticeship going to our high schools, partnering with our high schools, creating that nurse apprenticeship program, to keep them to graduate high school and then become LPNs and then move up. Those programs that, that, that I described in my statement have all been uh, supported through the Oxford Health System. Um, but to scale them, uh, we need support from our universities, we need support from our community colleges, we need support from our government. So I do think it's a partnership. Good news, I see that happen happening back in my own home state. Anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to make a point that's often missed, which is our health care is actually sick care. And if we focused on keeping people without the need to see a doctor be hospitalized, that's the solution. And some of that $4.3 trillion we spend on sick care, if we reduce that by 10%, we'd have $400 billion to invest in public health. And that's exactly what we should be doing, in my humble opinion. Amen to that, because uh, part with this, uh, Back 15 years ago when I was sick and tired of hearing how lucky I was that it's only going up 5 to 10% each year, I was large enough to self-insure. I found out they were making 25% profit margins on the plan I had in place, and the insurance companies told me just what you said. Ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. Avoid the business we're in. I took it to heart, paid for 100% of wellness, skin in the game from dollar one, we have not had a premium increase in 15 years, and I got a healthier profile of employees. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Brunn. Um, if you see people running in and out, it's not lack of interest. It's a vote on the floor. Uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to thank everyone for being here today as well. 
In rural areas like New Mexico, primary care providers serve as vital lifelines for all healthcare needs. That's why the Project ECHO model, which was developed at the University of New Mexico by Dr. Sanjeev Aurora, is so critical. Dr. Herbert, Project ECHO, as you know from the University of New England, Maine's own effort is a telementoring model that gives healthcare providers access to the tools and mentoring they need to treat complex medical cases. Project ECHO was found to be effective at equipping primary rural providers to screen for skin cancer when patients don't have access to dermatologists. That's just one example. Dr. Herbert, as we work to address the shortage of healthcare providers in rural areas, how can we better utilize and innovate models like Project ECHO to expand access to life-saving medical care? Excellent question. Thank you very much. And we do have a Project ECHO project at um, our university as well. So I appreciate the question. I think it touches on a number of issues. First of all, the importance of prevention that we were just talking about, um, early, early assessment and intervention of problems, um, training primary care uh, professionals to stretch their scope of practice. So earlier today we were talking about scope of practice laws that are overly limiting in terms of what primary care can do. So universities have a role in making sure, not just in training new students, but in providing continuing education and professional development for existing providers um, using tools like Project ECHO, but also uh, other kinds of continuing education tools to make sure that our primary care workers, uh, physicians and others, are equipped to address a broader range of concerns. Because there's no way in a rural state we're going to be able to place highly trained specialists of every kind in every community. I appreciate that very much. And Mr. Chairman, what we've already seen and witnessed, the benefits of ECHO models uh, for health delivery, we're starting to see more and more benefit for educational opportunities as well with that ECHO model. So I'm hoping that we'll see expansion. Um, Dr. Hildreth, this will be for you, sir. Uh, despite the growing need for behavioral health services, the behavioral health workforce has unfortunately been hemorrhaging workers. More than 122 million Americans and 65% of New Mexicans live in areas with mental health professional shortages. While training and education are critical to build on behavioral health workforce, I want to focus on keeping the providers we have. <laughs> Dr. Hildreth, how would dedicated retention efforts for behavioral health workers impact this vital workforce? I think the retention is a really important part of our strategy, but I would also say that giving more training in behavioral health to primary care physicians who are at the front lines of this. We're not going to be able to train enough psychiatrists to solve this problem, but by bolstering the training of primary care doctors in behavioral health, that's going to be a big part of the solution. And again, one of the things I worry about is they play such an important role in our health care system, but they're, to me, underpaid for what they do because they're the front line in bringing down the costs. Because if you can catch someone early with a chronic disease and get them into care, that's going to reduce the long-term cost to the country. So I would just suggest that training primary care doctors in behavioral health has to be a part of the solution. Thank you. I, I very much appreciate that, doctor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Swanee, how can we explore promoting utilization of services um, to include uh, midwife expansion and benefits? I, I've been a big proponent um, and having to explain to so many that the services that midwives provide is not just delivering babies um, to many communities. This is the only care that they have, and, and, and they're the primary care providers in the area. So in that respect, how can we explore promoting utilization of these services to not only support these families, but strengthen the healthcare workforce as well? Thank you. Yes, nurse midwives provide really vital care you know, throughout the postpartum period, prepartum, and, and during. Um, and they work often with doulas, and I, I think there's been a lot of emphasis today about rural areas, and I think that focusing also on the infrastructure we do have in rural areas, like um, postal workers, you know, like daycare centers, like Meals on Wheels, um, that we've got a lot of infrastructure we can take advantage of for the health of the nation. But back to the midwives, um, they're just really essential components, often underlooked, and can provide really comprehensive tailored care. I appreciate that response. And Mr. Chairman, in my closing time, um, Senator Murkowski uh, was asking some questions around EMS providers as well, which I very much appreciate the attention there. Um, as, as some of you may know, I survived a stroke a year ago. Um, my sister, who took me to the hospital from a rural community 30 minutes or so away from Santa Fe, 
uh, to where I live, had the foresight to stop at a local fire department because they were washing vehicles as she was passing by. That was five minutes from my home. Those EMS providers provided incredible care to me, immediately being able to provide stabilization, and I know communicating with that emergency room before I arrived. Had it not been for them, I don't know that I would be here today. So I hope that we will see more support and attention with this kind of service, and especially acknowledging some local governments and communities across the country, their budgets don't allow for that kind of investment. So um, I thank you for that as well. Well, thank you, Senator. And I did mention that in my opening remarks, and we're gonna get back to that. Senator Cassidy has been a true gentleman, scholar, gentleman, uh, allowing his colleagues to go before him. Senator Cassidy. Yes, and I have lots of questions, but even though I'm last limited time, so I'll go a little rapid fire. It's been a fantastic panel, by the way. I don't know if we've ever seen this much kind of participation from members, and congrats to the chair. I think it's just gone very well, and you've all been really good. Um, and uh, Dr. Swanee, happy Mardi Gras to all of those who are not as blessed as you and I to live in New Orleans and for this upcoming weekend. Um, we've got to do something relatively quickly. Facilities for HBCUs, nursing, the pipeline, it's actually kind of okay, it finally gets there. One of the things that I've been thinking about how we could initially, boom, have an impact, aside from immigration change, which would be, which would be huge. Dr. Swanee, you mentioned the press of people coming to ERs and even the violence associated with. And I've read that we have an absence of medication-assisted therapy clinics. I'm assuming that a fair number of people come into ERs, and Dr. Hildreth, you're in an urban area as well. Oh, my gosh, Dr. Santon, oh, my gosh, that if we had effective MAT in which we were keeping people from coming to the ER because they were less likely to be in overdose or withdrawal, that that could be something that could be relatively quickly implemented to have a relatively rapid response. Dr. Swanee. Senator Cass, thank you for that question. I, look, I couldn't agree more. I think those are critical and important. I think it goes beyond just the, the, the medication assistance therapies programs. There's other inter interventions like it was mentioned digital uh, medicine, digital monitoring, but there's actually digital management programs, digital hypertension, digital diabetes. We did a pilot in 3,000 Medicaid patients in rural areas where we managed their diabetes um, or their uh, hypertension through the digital program. And we showed in one year in a Medicaid population, decreased hospitalizations, decreased ER visits. So I think you're right, Senator Cassidy, we need to move care into the community to prevent the ER visits. That's been a theme from all of you. Dr. Steger, I have been just chomping at the bit to ask you this question, you ready? The sophistication of your research, you say that the pass rate of licensing exam is yeah. down. Now, you've done some sort of multivariate analysis. Is it who's less likely to pass? Is it the online school? Is it the for-profit school? Is it the person who graduated during the pandemic? Is it poor preparation prior to coming to school? What are the variables that can be affected? So we're working on that, and I don't have good Oh, come on. Yet. But, <laughs> but I, can, I, I have some answers. Uh, uh, the, the, the people who are not passing the licensure exam are people who were in nursing school during the pandemic. And all belief is that it was the, you know. So that not, cuts across your institution. Johns Hopkins cuts, all the way to your community college. That's a, they, well, I can't say Johns Hopkins specifically, but, but they are seeing it across the board in, in terms of the, the declining path. Let me ask you then, I, yeah. online nursing instruction, which I'll come back yeah. to you, ma'am. Online nursing instruction, I mean, I'm a by the bedside person. And your quote, I'll steal it, Dr. Hildreth, I'll attribute it the first time, but then after, after that, I'll just forget you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking to 100 people is a great way to teach, but a bad way to learn. So online seems like a great way to teach, but a bad way to learn for nursing skills. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, I think the challenge has been particularly for clinical skills, right? Yes. That bedside skills. And the exam, and it's changing in April, is, focuses increasingly on clinical skills and clinical experience for the, the nurse licensure exam. So that is becoming, you know, that, that, the, the, the belief is that the pass rate's gonna get much worse this year, you know, this next year because of that. Because there's been a lack of preparation for clinical. Lack of the, the so clinical let me move on. experience Dr. with Dr. Sam, patients. I suspect you're chomping at the bit. <laughs> now, uh, I, I endorse what Marshall said. 
the woman or the man that goes to the community college, I think is pro probably more likely to stay in her community. And I will just say from my personal experience as a physician, certificate nurses, uh, the one that I worked with for 30 years, uh, she was just fantastic. There's a clear bias towards BSNs, but it seems more expensive. It seems a longer pipeline to get them out. And again, as he says, there may be a, a predisposition for those folks to stay where they were trained at the university town as opposed to their community. So we've got a couple things to throw before you. One, what about that, uh, the Marshall uh, issue? Dr. Steger, what about this kind of um, clinical skills gap? Uh, and, and what should we be thinking about in terms of online training and what I would intuitively think would make them less prepared? Thank you very much for those questions. The, about the online training, so at Johns Hopkins, I can't speak for all nursing schools, but at Johns Hopkins, when we talk about an online program, it's, what they mean is that the, some of the didactic portion, when you're learning about pathophysiology and you're learning about how the heart works, and um, that that can be online and modules. But they come to, to campus multiple times a year, and they have clinical experiences wherever they are. There's, there's, at least at Johns Hopkins, there's no such thing as online only nursing program. That there's, to your point, that wouldn't make sense. Um, and Do about, I know that there's some online only classes? Do I know that? Some universities classes. all do 100% online. Dr. Steger, do you know that? I, there's there, quite. There's there. during the pandemic, and there was. Yes. Typically. Yeah. Typically, no, right? They okay. all. Well, so, so, for example, at Johns Hopkins, you know, March 2020, everything shut down briefly. Exactly. We pivoted quickly, and people were, were back doing clinical hours. Sometimes they were more out in the community than in the hospital, for example, but people got really hands on clinical experiences during the pandemic. I, I want to just mention about the RN. I wouldn't call it a bias, um, respectfully, um, towards RN, you know, BSN education. That there's decades of evidence, and I'm sure you could back me up, showing that health systems that have a higher proportion of BSNs um, have better health outcomes for the patients. It, of course, you need a team of all different kinds of people, but there's a lot and a lot of evidence that we'd be happy to share over time. Um, about that, that need for the BSNs as now, well. Now, if the choice is between the marginal increase and in an outcome, which again, you'd want a multivariate analysis to look at that, um, as opposed to having a shortage of nurses, which would be more impactful? More nurses or more of them being BSNs? Yeah, it, I, nurses first, right? Then skills, then, the, then upskilling. And, and, you know, the evidence, National Academy of Medicine came out and this was their recommendation, so I won't argue with that. It's not perfect evidence, but it's good evidence. The, I think the key to the uh, associate degree nurses is it's the entry and the career steps. You know, it's a way for people to get in with two years, but then have a career ahead of them where they can get trained up to be a, a bachelor's nurse, and the key is facilitating that. That's how you get people to enter at these lower wage jobs is they see the career ahead. I'm so with it upskill. Can I have one more question? Um, Dr. Hildreth, uh, you alluded to, Dr. Stanton spoke of specifically, that if we address the um, burden of chronic disease, we can decrease our utilization. Dr. Swanee mentioned an innovative program in terms of digital health. Uh, we're going to have some hearings on pharmaceuticals, but whatever we say about pharmaceuticals, they've been incredibly innovative. We know the burden of metabolic disease disproportionately falls upon the poor, and that if we can do something about the metabolic syndrome, uh, then we're going to decrease renal failure, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, stroke. Um, I say that, I'm not sure there's a question there, but just an observation that there's been a consistent refrain that if we do something about the burden of chronic disease, that we can decrease the demand upon our healthcare facilities, if you will, a more fundamental way to address the shortfall uh, as opposed to just more nursing schools, which we also need. Any comment on that, sir? Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, I'll just repeat what I said earlier. Our healthcare system is actually a sick care system. We need to be focused on the social determinants of health where you live, where you work, how much money you make, your, your educational attainment, all of those things contribute much more to your health than going to see a doctor. Now, mind you, I'm in the business of training doctors, dentists, researchers, but the reality is that what we need more of is investment in public health. And I would argue that reintegrating public health and primary care is the best way forward. 
so we can actually get better outcomes for communities, not one person at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, look, I agree with uh, Senator Cassidy. I thought this, Senator Cassidy, was an extraordinary hearing. Uh, I think we had the attendance of virtually every member here on both sides, which tells, should tell us and tell all of us, rural, urban, no matter where you're from, we got a major crisis in healthcare workforce. Uh, so I get, this has been a great panel, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. We're going to get back to you. We are going to produce legislation. I don't do hearings for the sake of hearings. Uh, and all of you have been invaluable in your uh, contribution. So let's work together. Let's do something for the American people. And thank you very much. Um, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, March 3rd at 5 p.m. Finally, I ask unanimous consent to enter at the record a statement from Senator Cassidy. Uh, and uh, 19 statements from stakeholder groups sharing their health care workforce priorities. Uh, so ordered, the committee stands adjourned.